Are we ready to get started? Um, well, thank you so much. We're here for a public meeting on Tuesday, March 22nd. It is a little after 530. Can I get a roll call um, to establish quorum, please? Ms. Counts? Ms. Luna Rose? Here. Dr. Robbie? Here. Ms. Shaw? Here. Ms. Grijalva? Here. And so um, I want to thank you all. This is the first time that we're on the dais for three of our board members. And um, I do want to take a point of personal privilege before we get started to congratulate our board staff member, Michelle Gutierrez, for 25 years with Tucson Unified. She is going to be retiring, and I think this is officially her last meeting, but I always tell everyone when they retire from TUSD, if you don't want to keep working, don't answer the phone. But she wrote a lovely um, letter of resignation, and she addressed it, and she acknowledged that she served over the last 25 years with 16 board members, eight superintendents, two deputy superintendents, two assistant superintendents, and many, many, many directors. And so, Michelle Gutierrez, thank you very much for 25 years of service. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so now we're going to go ahead and um, move on to the land acknowledgement. And we have Billy Romero. I see you, Billy. You're in eighth grade. You're from Dodge Magnet. And I'm going to read a little bit about you, okay? You are, Billy Romero is a member of the Pascua Yaqui tribe of Arizona. He's currently an eighth grader at Dodge Middle Magnet. Billy has been in band, in orchestra, and played volleyball while attending Dodge. Billy has also been a member of the National Junior Honor Society for the past two years and will be an incoming freshman at University High in the fall of 2022. Thank you so much for taking time, Billy, to read the land acknowledgement statement, and we're gonna go ahead and put that up on the screen for you. Do you see it? Yes, I do. Oh, good, and we can hear you very well. Whenever you're ready, sir. All right. On behalf of the governing board of the Tucson Unified School District, I, Billy Romero, acknowledge that the schools, buildings, and facilities of Tucson Unified School District reside on the ancestral homeland of the Tohtana Atom Nation and the federally recognized tribal land of the Pasco Yaqui tribe. Well, thank you so much, Billy. Thank you for joining us. Good luck at the end of your eighth grade year and at UHS. Yep, it sounds like you have, you're doing really great in school, so it's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you. So we have um, our Pledge of Allegiance is going to be read by Alex Harper, and we see Alex right there. He is in third grade at Robbins K-8, and I'm going to read a little bit about you, okay, Alex? Yeah. Alex is a baseball player. He plays for Western Little League, and his position is third base. Tough position. Alex also participates in track and basketball. He is a member of our family engagement team. His favorite subject is reading. And he is very knowledgeable about tribes in Arizona, of Arizona. He loves his dogs and, of course, his big brother. Mom is a teacher at Robbins K-8 in fifth grade. And his big brother, Boone Jr., is a fifth grade student at Robbins K-8. And his dad, Boone Sr., is a social worker for Veterans Hospital. Thank you, Alex, for joining us. And I'm wondering if you can lead us in the pledge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we will stand up and you go whenever you're ready. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you very much, Alex. How is it to have your mom, a teacher at Robbins, where you go to school? Oh, well, it's good because I don't have to like, take the bus after school and wait a while. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I just get to hang out after school in the classroom. Well, that's fun. Well, I hope you have the best end of your third grade year. And mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Okay, so next we have agenda adjustments. Dr. Trujillo. 
Yes, uh, President Grijalva, sound check, can everybody hear me? Testing, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, President Grijalva, members of the uh, governing board, welcome back everybody live uh, and in person. I have two agenda adjustments this evening. Number one, I'd like to pull item 8.1 from the agenda. And uh, number two, my second agenda adjustment request is to move up uh, item 9.1 to immediately following the call to the audience. Okay, board members, any objections? Um, all, those in, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, item passes. So, okay. Now we're on awards and recognition, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, awards and recognitions. So we start this evening uh, on a sad note, as we say goodbye to one of our bright shining stars at uh, Tucson High. Uh, Omar Alfredo Casas Varela, a senior at Tucson High. Uh, he was a, an extremely cheerful, and happy young man, uh, full of love and light with a kind and humble heart. His mind, body, and spirit, always in tune in an impressive way, this allowed him to fully enjoy the little things in life despite adversity. His passion and interest leaned toward the area of zoology because of the immense love he had for animals. His favorite hobbies included being a passionate collector of valuable video game items and penguins of all kinds. He enjoyed music, dancing, reading, video games, board games, Legos, Pokemon game cards, playing the piano, watching videos on YouTube. And most of all, he loved spending quality time with his family and his friends. For people who had the joy of knowing this incredible young man and being a part of his life, they felt the love and the energy that he transmitted with his soft, sincere hugs and his contagious smile. He lived a long life for such a young age, and he sowed much love in all the people around him. Our condolences on behalf of the Tucson Unified School District to the Casas family and the Badger community for the loss of such an outstanding young man. Let's observe a moment of silence. Thank you. Our next recognition, a huge talent out of the Pueblo community. Let us congratulate Giselle Abre. She is a big winner at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley Festival for mariachi vocalists, one of the premier competitions for mariachi vocalists in the nation. Giselle won first place in the vocal competition at the festival, and it is a mariachi festival hosted by our friends at Mariachi Aslan of University of Texas, the Rio Grande Valley. Congratulations again, Giselle. Our next recognition is proudly presented to Pister Middle School, big winners at the SARCEF Awards uh, 2022. The top teacher award went to Rosina West, SARCEF champion, educator of science and engineering, and some outstanding emerging scientists and scientific thinkers. Middle school and high school awards to Jacob Valenzuela, third place for a pocket-sized alert. Natalia Nunez, third place, are more expensive acrylic paints better. Joel Perez Garcia, third place for his project, Total Meltdown. And the sponsored awards, which were awarded to all grade levels, Madeline Smith, Guinea Pigs for the Win, Special Distinction, SARSEF Board of Directors Award, Eliza Purcell, Oh Chute, don't fail me now. Wow, AIA, AIAA Award for Excellence and Science or Engineering Project. Uh, congratulations to these absolutely outstanding students. We'll now move over to University High School for its SARCEF distinctions, the 68th Annual SARCEF Southern Arizona Research Science and Engineering Foundations Fair was held March 2nd and 3rd, 2022. University High School was named the top high school at the event. Congratulations to the sponsoring supervising teachers, Ms. Elise Wexler and Dr. Tara Artuleta. 21 students placed project recognitions, four first place, seven second place, 10 third place, 21 sponsored awards and recognitions from the organizations noted at the competition. Congratulations to all. One of the iconic programs in the whole of the Tucson Unified community is the famed Odyssey of the Minds program over at McGee Middle School. 
Odyssey of the Mind was held on March 5th, 2022. And University High Odyssey of the Mind Club won first place at the regional competition. They will compete in the state competition at CDO at, on March 26th. Their structure held 640 pounds. The next closest schools held 200 pounds in comparison. Thank you and congratulations again to our teacher sponsor, Karen Rogers, for the team's great work. And the accolades for University High School continue in our next recognition as we take time out to recognize the Penguins National Merit finalists. The National Merit Scholarship Program is an academic competition for recognition and scholarships that began in 1955. Approximately 1.5 million high school students enter the program each year. About 16,000 semifinalists were selected earlier this year, competing for about 7,500 scholarships. This year, University High School has 15 finalists vying for one of these prestigious scholarships. It goes without saying, National Merit Scholarship is one of the premier scholarship opportunities available to high school students across the nation. So this year, we want to congratulate our 15 finalists. I want to start with Rory Bricka, Jisway Choi, Rachel Dye, Rebecca Flack, Malia Hotan, Kristen Jung, Jade Kwan, Nathan Po, Giro Ma, Saptarshi Malik, Oka Sanghi, Stefan Steely Yukner, Katarina Terrell, Jacob Underwood, and Michael Yang. Congratulations again. It should be noted Jade Kwan and Nathan Kuo, they're also candidates for the U.S. Presidential Scholars Program. So congratulations to our outstanding Penguin Scholars. The Saguaro Girls Soccer Team earned the Arizona Interscholastic Association Sportsman Award. Our Lady Cougars soccer program led by head coach Dave Krasuski has been outstanding for 20 plus years. Their excellence is nothing new for the Tucson Unified community, but we're glad it's being recognized on a statewide level. Our Coach K, not to be confused with Duke's Coach K, always gets the most out of his team, and they are consistently contending for a region title and always make the state playoffs. His teams are continually well-versed, not only in the game of soccer, but also in the, in, in the use of great sportsmanship with opposing teams and officials. We are proud to announce that this year, our Saguaro girls soccer team was recognized by the 4A conference as the sportsmanship award winners as voted on by the officials. Go Cougars, continue to make us proud. UHS returns again for more accolades, UHS Science Olympiad. The Science Olympiad was held on March 9th. University High School Science Olympiad team placed first overall and were declared the winners of the Southern Regional Division C of Science Olympiad. <coughs> they will compete at the state level competition on April 2nd. Sponsoring and supervising teacher was Mr. Kevin Nieves uh, Pichardo. The slide shows, as the slide shows, a large number of diverse awards won by our team members. Congratulations, UHS Science Olympiad. And let us recognize and congratulate our own Lindsay Aguilar, our director for food services, she is, has been elected in the Arizona Department of Education, Health and Nutrition Services uh, to serve on the School Nutrition Association Board of Directors. So I want to congratulate uh, Lindsay for her outstanding recognition. Lindsay uh, oftentimes has to deliver lots of bad news to the young people of the district that want the pizza and the Cheetos and the soda, and uh, Lindsay's very good uh, engaging our young people and explaining the parameters of the National School Lunch Program. We know she'll continue to provide that leadership in her new role. And our next recognition, let us recognize Delia Sotelo Ocampo for excellence and resiliency in mathematics in the teaching of mathematics. Ms. Otelo Campo incorporates math modeling pro projects that are relevant and culturally responsive. Her mission view students are highly engaged as she leads them through the inquiry process in solving math problems. She embodies what it truly means to engage students in meaningful, relevant, project-based, integrated learning. She deserves this recognition as a role model for others and in recognition of the tremendous amount of time, effort, 
and the passion she puts into her work. Congratulations, uh, Delia. I look forward to my next visit to Mission View, where I definitely will be stopping by your classroom to see your greatness in action. And with that, President Grijalva, members of the governing board, that concludes awards and recognitions. Thank you so much, Dr. Trujillo. Um, now we're on to the superintendent's report. President Grijalva, members of the governing board, tonight presents a pivot, a pivot away from our board meetings and the superintendent's reports being so dominated by the pandemic that has us all fatigued, and a return to a focus on student achievement, the teaching and learning of our district, the business of growing our kids. So the feature tonight will be talking about the state of student achievement in the Tucson Unified School District, the tremendous resiliency and growth that our students have shown on our internal benchmarks and our pre and post tests that we administered uh, earlier in the year. Tonight we will talk about the extensive and comprehensive framework of teaching and learning, our approach to delivering classroom instruction, and how we're combating interrupted learning. Uh, interrupted learning is our preferred term, as learning is never truly lost. When kids learn, that knowledge is always there. It just needs to be reactivated. So we're gonna talk tonight, a little bit later in this agenda, about tiered instruction, how our teachers approach their classrooms and provide differentiated support according to the levels of need of students in their classroom. We'll talk about the MTSS process, a very, very important mechanism on each and every TUSD campus that makes sure that students that are most at risk are seen by the professionals that care about them most, that have the skill set and knowledge to deliver the interventions where they're needed most. We'll talk about ESSA, the Every School Succeeds Act, and its requirement that schools and school districts employ only the very, very best research-based uh, instructional pedagogy when delivering interventions or classroom instruction. We'll also talk about the intervention structures and programs that have been in place the entire year to address interrupted learning because of the pandemic and to shore up the skills and the abilities and the standards and the understanding of those standards on the part of our students who are working off grade level. We'll talk about the highly successful targeted learning session initiative that gets our students ready for the assessment season. And lastly, we'll talk about the success that we've seen with some of our digital platforms, particularly at middle school. And we'll see how students that are exposed to these platforms begin, start, to, start to begin outperforming students on AZ Merit and other standardized measures uh, when compared with students that don't have access to these platforms. The spirit of tonight is about growth. And my message to the 2,700 classroom teachers who have been working night and day, relentlessly, tirelessly through the days and nights of this pandemic, dealing with interrupted learning, dealing with students who have been traumatized, dealing with families who have been struggling, is tonight we're going to celebrate growth because growth is how growth is the definition of learning. We understand that we are responsible for proficiency. We understand that we are responsible for passage rates. But we also understand that as an organization dedicated to learning, it is important to celebrate every single instance that our teachers grow students academically in reading, writing, listening, speaking, and math. And we have some benchmark data and we have some assessment data that we've administered that's gonna celebrate that growth and acknowledge that our students are learning more today and demonstrating more growth in ling English language arts today and in math than they were when they walked in the doors on August 4th. We'll learn a little bit more about tiered support if I can get the next slide. And what it means to deliver tier one support. The goal of all of our teachers in this district is for all of our students to learn concepts and skills and ideas the very first time that they teach it. And the most valuable tool that our teachers have is the instructional strategies that they employ, whether they're teaching reading or writing or math or science or biology. But when our students don't get it, we graduate to tier two. Tier two, those are the interventions and the strategies that kick in when students need reteaching. When our students don't get the skills and the concepts and the standards the first time out. And then of course we have tier three. Tier three, when our students, the general instruction of the larger group, the reteaching of the smaller group, 
aren't enhancing our students' understanding of the material, the concepts, or the skills. We know that it is extremely important that every single school in this district have an extensive tier three intensified support piece. A lot of times this means one-on-one -on -one instruction with a reading interventionist or a math interventionist. This may require a team to convene to examine the extent to which students need beyond the classroom support. This is a very, very important framework to understand for our governing board as we talk about student achievement tonight, the classroom. Traditionally 25 students, you're going to have tier one students, those who will learn the information the first time. In, that 25, in those 25 students, you're gonna have tier two students. Some students may need the information taught to them a little more than once. And then as we know, in every classroom across this district, we're always going to have students who need us at a tier three level. So I'm excited that our curriculum and instruction team will be getting into student achievement tonight. Before we proceed, a word about AZ Merit. We understand that the community, now that we're entering assessment season, is starting to revisit TUSD's performance on 2021 during the last academic year, which of course featured an unprecedented amount of interrupted learning due to the pandemic. And we know that our board members, most notably Dr. Shaw on the radio show last week, have had to answer some tough questions. It is extremely important to remind our community, yes, the proficiency scores in 2021, are challenging. But in all fairness to the Tucson Unified Community, only 56% of our students took the test. It was not a mandatory test. Those scores are not a true reflection of the entire population of TUSD testing. 44% of the eligible testing population did not take the test. TUSD was not the only district in the state of Arizona to experience a decline in proficiency rates in both ELA and math. Statewide, proficiency rates fell 13% in math and 7% in ELA. TUSD's proficiency rate fell 17% in math and 11% in ELA. Challenges with remote learning, pandemic-related absenteeism for students and staff, the pandemic's exacerbating effects on poverty and mental health created an extremely difficult environment for standardized assessments. The bright spots, both the district's internal benchmark assessments and its pre and post assessment data indicate the possibility of an impressive academic recovery for our students in 21-22. We're looking forward to seeing some of that tonight as our curriculum and instruction team presents to the governing board. With that, President Grijalva, members of the governing board, that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Um, now we're on to board member activity reports. Board members? Ms. Grijalva? Yes, Ms. Luna Rose. Thank you. Um, and I would like to thank uh, the district as a point of personal privilege to make sure that we've got um, chairs for people to sit and that, um, that we're open to public. So uh, thank you. Um, and thanks for those who are watching online. Okay, so um, kind of, I just, I, I, made, I quickly made a list and realized that I was a little busy um, getting around the district. So I was a debate judge at Wakefield Middle School, um, which was a lot of fun. It was a sixth grade class. And I listened to students um, debate pro and con on two issues, universal basic income and water bottles. And um, there was five members um, and Ms. Shaw was also uh, with me that day, um, as well as I believe um, Supervisor Scott from um, Pima County Board of Supervisors and um, other administrators from the district. So that I really enjoyed that. Um, I stopped by the March 5th event at Catalina High School with all the um, uh, schools and departments out and it was really nice to see the community out. There was a, a lot going on. There was uh, mariachi, some of our lovely mariachi groups and bands and so um, I thought that was a really nice event and I stopped by as many tents as I could. We have a lot. Um, uh, took a tour at Shoemaker Center. Uh, thanks to Ms. Nordbrock and Ms. Kivit for their time. If you have not had a chance, board members, to go check out Shoemaker, I would. It's such a lovely little place, and if, if you're having a bad day, you can walk into the little infant room, and it just automatically brightens your, 
your day. They're just so cute and they're doing a wonderful job there. So I wanted to thank them for allowing me to come by. Um, also did the Rincon High School Family Info Night. Uh, Ms. Welch and um, her team uh, went through some uh, their classes and what they could offer and uh, that was also very informative, so thank you to them. And lastly, I did stop by the TOSD tent at the UVA Festival Woods, and there was a lot of neat goodies, and I missed out on the sunglasses that were there, so. Um, but uh, I think um, TOSD was, uh, there was a busy tent as I, when I went by, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luna Rose. Um, Dr. Ravi? Uh, thank you, Principal Grijalva. Um, I'm gonna start my report by just giving an extra shout out to the UHS Science Olympiad team and, and for all your successes. I still have my first place medal from seventh grade when I uh, won a uh, regional back in Chicago's uh, Science Olympiad competition and still best friends with the two members of my, of my team from seventh grade who I saw just a few months ago uh, when they visited from uh, the Midwest. So a quick shout out to, to all of you uh, who participated um, in that. Uh, like Ms. Luna Rose, uh, busy last couple of weeks, especially as we concluded Love of Reading uh, weeks at a number of schools. Uh, I was able to um, make it over to my uh, home school at Lion Weaver Elementary, where my daughter is a fourth grade student, and got to embarrass her, hopefully uh, significantly, uh, reading to her class. Uh, we were able to get through uh, part of a chapter of The Hobbit, which is something that the two of us had read together. Uh, and finished a few months ago. Um, and so really appreciate getting to uh, her fourth grade class at Lime Weaver, uh, as well as uh, two other classes there, uh, and was able to make it down to Grajava Elementary School as well uh, to read to a few classes um, there, uh, which was a great experience heading back over to uh, our, our Southwest uh, part of our district. Uh, I was able to also make it over to Wakefield. Uh, thank you, Principal uh, Taravati, uh, for the tour of our beautiful Wakefield campus. And it was great to see all of the uh, structural and, and improvements and what it would really look like to have um, just significant infrastructure improvements at a, at a school and what was really possible. So really great to see that as well as uh, judge the sixth grade debate competition. Uh, I was able to be joined by our own general counsel, uh, Mr. Ross, uh, at that session and we uh, also covered universal basic income, but also universal health care. It was a great hearing from the amazing sixth graders at Wakefield um, Junior Middle School for, uh, for that debate competition. Uh, I received a tour of Blenman Elementary School. Uh, my twins are in preschool at uh, Climbing Tree Elementary, or excuse me, Climbing Tree Preschool, which is on the Blenman Elementary School campus. And so I was there reading to uh, my twins' preschool class and uh, received an amazing tour of the great community of Blenman Elementary. Uh, and as Dr. Trujillo mentioned, uh, joined Zach Yenser on the tipping point to represent the district, uh, speaking about uh, the new changes uh, in COVID mitigation, as well as academic achievement in our district. Uh, so great, great month uh, representing TUSD and looking forward uh, in just a week to be heading over to the National School Board Association's conference and hopefully getting some great education and, and being even a more effective uh, school board member. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Ms. Shaw. Thank you, Ms. Grijalva. Um, well, I managed to get on to the Davis Mountain Air Force Base to visit Borman K-8 um, and sat down with their principal, Ms. Sisler, to hear about some of the issues happening at that school and was also given a tour of their campus. Um, I also had the privilege of visiting Utterback to see their inspiring Black History Month installation uh, that Ms. Williams and Ms. Angelica created uh, that deals with not only African history uh, from the continent, but also dives into so many aspects of the civil rights era that most people don't know about, including myself. Um, and I wanna thank Ms. Williams and uh, Ms. Angelica for doing such an amazing job with um, that installation. And if you're interested in hearing um, more about that installation, please reach out to Ms. Amber Williams at Utterback. Um, and as Ms. Luna Rose states, I attended the sixth grade debates with her at Wakefield and was one of their guest judges. And I'll tell you what, it was really difficult to um, decide on a winner for those debates because the students were so eloquent um, and prepared to defend their side. Uh, we also got a tour of Wakefield and I'm still uh, just so blown away 
by the beauty of that campus and all of the advanced technology being utilized in the classroom. So uh, hats off to Wakefield. Um, I visited Tucson High School's advanced drama class again with Mr. Omquist for the kickoff of their uh, storytelling project podcast and was subsequently invited by um, Ms. Rodriguez to attend the four women play um, detailing the life of Nina Simone um, with some Tucson High School students and staff last week at the Arizona Theater Company. Um, I also had a chance to visit the I Have a Dream exhibition at Tucson High School uh, Gallery, which is open to the public. Um, in that uh, exhibition, they displayed student artwork, uh, historic photos from some Tucson High School alumni uh, from the 1960s. Uh, but what stood out to me in this exhibit was the oral histories from the Library of Congress uh, where formerly enslaved people shared their experience. One of those narratives was recorded in 1937 from a woman named Sarah Frances Shaw. And it reads, I was born March 23rd, 1850 in Kentucky, somewhere near Louisville. I'm going on 88 years now. I was brought to Missouri when I was six months old, along with my mom, who was a slave owned by a man named Shaw. A man named Shaw. Yeah. So um, I do want to invite the public to check out this exhibit. It's open to the public. Uh, you could go at any time, and it will be open until April 20th in the gallery. Um, and then Recently, I spent time with the family of Zachariah Ibrahim, who was tragically killed recently by an officer from the Pima County Sheriff's Department. Zachariah had just turned 17. He was a TUSD student at Catalina Online Learning Experience. And um, sharing a meal with his family and listening to his mother and his family as they grieve, I heard about Zachariah's life and also his more recent struggles with mental illness, which unfortunately led to the incident on Saturday, March 12th, that I truly, truly wish could have ended differently. And I'd like us to take a moment of silence to contemplate the loss of Zachariah and all those who are struggling to overcome mental illness. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I visited a couple campuses, uh, Lawrence, Sewell, myers Ganung, Glenman, Sam Hughes, Monzo, Tully, Oyama, Wright, and Tolson. Um, I'm trying to visit all of our elementary schools as this is my last year on the board, so I wanna make sure to, you know, go check it out and, and just thank everyone for all of their service. I know, um, this pandemic has been incredibly difficult to so many, and so it's been nice to be able to visit on campuses. Um, I also was a speaker at Adelante Nuestro Futuro at the U of A, um, same weekend as the Festival of Books, so it was a busy U of A campus. And so um, with that, we'll go ahead and move on to call to the audience, and I'll go ahead and turn over the mic to Clerk Luna Rose. Thank you, President Grijalva. During the call to the audience, the board clerk will recognize speakers and maintain order by setting appropriate limitations. The governing board is committed to the safety of the entire TUSD community. In order to observe the recommended safeguards for reducing the rate of speed of COVID-19, the following procedures related to call to the audience portion of the board meetings will be observed. All public comments for the meeting were accepted by either emailing or calling the board office to have names added to the list, or by emailing written comments to be read to the record by noon the day of the meeting. If public comments were sent in, they will be read into the record by the program coordinator of staff services to the governing board. Individuals addressing the board should observe rules of propriety and good conduct and refrain from impertinent or slanderous remarks. TOSD serves students from all ages, so speakers should be aware that children may be present or listening. Our staff will make sure each board member receives a copy of all written comments. 
At the conclusion of the call to the audience, the governing board president will ask if individual board members wish to respond to criticism made by those who have addressed the board, wish to ask the staff to review a matter, or wish to ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. By law, at most two board members can address any single issue raised during call to the audience. And our first comment is from Ms. Lillian Fox. Hidden next to the last on tonight's agenda at TUSD Student Achievement Progress Report and Intervention. On any grades, grading scale, the grade on TUSD's progress would be an F and pitifully few students are getting the targeted learning sessions. For example, only 36 high school students got targeted learning sessions out of how many high school students who were struggling. It may not matter that only 4.4% of all TUSD students are getting targeted learning sessions, TLS, because the data presented tonight shows that TLS didn't work in 2018 through 19, pre-pandemic, and if it's not working now either. At the end of the presentation, there's some data about another TUSD intervention, digital platform intervention. Digital platform intervention as, is just as ineffective as targeted learning sessions. In the middle school where it was used, 92% of the students were one year or more below grade level last year. 65% of the students were three or more years below grade level. Kids who can't read struggle to learn academic subjects on a computer. This year, after digital intervention, 83% of the students are still a year or more below grade level. 56% of the students are still three years or more behind. That's pitifully little progress towards any kind of proficiency. That's a disaster for students who need to graduate and get good jobs. TUSD's own numbers show that neither targeted learning sessions nor digital intervention are succeeding at helping students gain the knowledge and math skills they need for graduation and employment. With pitifully little progress and the failure to provide effective help to the large numbers of struggling students, TUSD should be ashamed. The governing board needs to hold leadership accountable and insist on effective support and substantial grant gains by students. Lillian Fox. Thank you. The next letter is from Ms. Virginia Bishi. It would not be enough for me to see a mask surgically attached to your faces for the rest of your lives because of the damage you've caused. The illegal mandates locally and nationwide from people like all of you on the board have caused tremendous physical and mental harm. You have no idea the long-term effects and you clearly do not care. You only care that you can rule over people. Adelita, you voting to have mask in the board meeting today is completely insane. Your own county meeting clearly voted on no mask anywhere. There should be zero mask usage in this meeting. We've all noticed if you do not get your way on in the Pima County BOS meeting, you take the anger and move it to get your way in the TUSD meeting. You have no business in the political position ever. I now have an enlarged heart because of the stress the mask caused my lungs. Heart damage does not repair itself. Adelita and Mr. Trujillo have been caught numerous times violating their own mandates. Adelita cried in her Pima County meeting. After being called out as a hypocrite that she is boosted and vaccinated, good for you, but it doesn't matter. I really don't care if you had 100 COVID shots. You can still transmit and contract, and contract COVID. Mr. Trujillo has been seen on social media at schools mass free. I really don't care if anyone was directly next to you. You do not give children a break, so you should not have a break until you leave your office for the day. The children continue to be harassed about putting their mask on. They want breaks too. You flaunt this is, this is in our faces on a daily basis. If any of you go grocery shopping or to a department store, you are around mask and vaccinated free, pe free people continuously. You have no idea what type of people are around you, so this board meeting should be no different. You're all hypocrites. You are here to better our ch children's education, not be a health instructor. I do not seek medical advice from any board member, some more than others. You all say you go with the science up until the science makes you uncomfortable. You've made me uncomfortable for a few years now. It is your turn to be uncomfortable. All COVID measures need to be gone and never come back. COVID is here to stay and you need to learn to live with it. Sadie mentioned she is afraid, maybe not those exact words, but that is what came across to the public. 
Nobody is taking your child's right away to wear a mask. You are taking choice from, from my children, though. Natalie mentioned her child and her child's friends want to continue to wear them. Great, wear them. My child doesn't. My kids are not a pawn in your game to play with. I decide what is safe for my kids and not any of you. Ravi is a physician and deep down knows what the board is imposing is morally wrong. Do you remember the oath you took? Do no harm. For any of you with a com compromised immune system, shame on you for not taking precautions prior to COVID. It is not my job to make you feel safe or to Excuse take precautions. Excuse me, Ms. Benya. Your three minutes, the three minutes are up for this comment. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Next is um, from Ms. Jean Kapusinski. Dear board members, at the last board meeting, general counsel read the public's comments so rapidly and monotonously that the content was, even, was often untangible. The opinions of parents, employees, and all community stakeholders should, should be valued and clearly heard. Comments and criticism of the district should not be read by general counsel, whose role is to protect the interest of the district. TUC has a history, history of obscuring the truth to minimize controversy. It is incumbent upon the board to be forthcoming and transparent and to allow the public's concern to be clearly heard. Still at issue are the unsafe conditions at date due to destaffing and relocation. Local news stations have revealed that the district has many students in need of intensive intervention with a high level of supervision. Due to the sudden and extreme staff reduction, DAPE can no longer safely offer those interventions. At previous board meetings, Dr. Trujillo falsely stated that DAPE had 12 teachers and that DAPE classrooms are subject to the TEA consensus of 32 to 36 students. He then used these facilities to justify the removal of DAPE teachers. As a result, there are now just three DAPE teachers, each working separately, leaving students with adequ without adequate supervision. Each of these remaining DAPE teachers has middle and high school students combined in one room. The sixth through 12th grade social and academic intermixing of students is not practiced elsewhere in TUSD and is considered to be unsafe and ill-advised particularly for students who have demonstrated aggress aggressive or risky behaviors. At the last board meeting, Dr. Trujillo proudly announced that funding would be allocated for district-wide facility improvements. Why then, can't, why then can't DAPE students be in actual classrooms as they were before? Are they less than? The Equity, Diversity, and Inclusiveness Department has negle neglected to include DAPE students. Why can't DAPE students and staff return to their former classrooms? No valid reason has been offered. The better access geographic spread claim is unfounded. The district has provided false and misleading information to the court and is using its legal team in for full force to repeatedly deny the request of the plaintiffs, which is simply to restore date to its previous staffing levels and locations. And why, spite and ego, how dare these teachers and plaintiffs interfere with the superintendent's decisions? Unfortunately, it is all at the expense of the safety, well-being, and education of vulnerable students, the majority board is complicit by way of in inaction. Sincerely, Jean Kapusinski. Thank you. Next is from Ms. Melissa Conroy. Gabriel, Sadie, Adelita, Ravi, Layla, and Natalie. Various face mask students prove their ineffectiveness if you would only do your research. Prior to mandates for COVID, masks were hardly worn in hospitals and other facilities. They were only used in operating rooms or for visiting seriously ill patients to prevent infection from spit or droplets into open wounds. Most people understood viruses were far too small to be stopped by wearing a mask of a mask and that doing this for long periods of time was unhealthy. But now there has been an international flood of lies about mask wearing in order to justify the situation we are living in. It has also continued long after COVID was discovered to not be as dangerous as we were led to believe, and that mitigation policies caused serious damage of all kinds, including many deaths. When prevention and treatment protocols were discovered and used with great success, the very best ones were often criminally suppressed by government and health authorities. Over the past two years, there have been numerous lies fed to the public by the World Health Organization, government leaders, the health bureaucrats, the media, and many other institutions, all for the purpose of maintaining fear until the large majority of the public 
has been injected with a poorly tested, unnecessary and dangerous COVID vaccines for which we have no evidence of their long-term safety. If you put our kids back in masks, you need to show us the clinical trials and peer reviewed studies of how masks are effective and how they save us from COVID. To date, this has never been done. Stating it's because of science means absolutely nothing without proof. Or is it, as I believe, that this is a pandemic based on a faulty PCR test and the propaganda of the mainstream media? Even the CDC is starting to backtrack on their numbers and say it is a coding error. So the CDC made parents get their kids injected with an experiment and had them wear masks all day for a coding error. The PCR is a fake test. It picks up influenza and the common cold because COVID was never isolated. That is why the test had to be brought out to 40 cycles. Because of all the false, false positives, how do you even know how many people actually died of COVID? Which is the reason you force keeping our kids in masks all day? We know the real reason you keep the mask on. It is because you get money from the government to do it. It has never been about health. Keep the mask off of our kids. Melissa Conroy, mother of two children in TUSD. Thank you. And the last letter for the evening is from Ms. Guadalupe Henninger. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Trujillo, legal counsel, President Grijalva, Clerk Luna Rose, and board members. Thanks to all of you in TUSD for your hard work. My name is Guadalupe Herringer, a TUSD parent. Even if Omicron numbers had been in decline, we should not let our guard down. Omicron variant BA2 is causing a virus rebound in Europe and Asia and gaining ground ar around here in the United States. Experts said, and are concerned about cases among children as schools lift mass requirements. This new administration is asking Congress to continue the COVID response and test and treatment to anybody who tests positive and want treatment. Funds are running out by the end of this month. We need to call Congress, our U.S. Senate, and House elected officials to tell them to continue funding the programs to keep up with the comprehensive and hard work that's been done for the last two years. At the state level, there is a blatant disregard for the rule of law and people's constitutional rights. They launder the lie about stolen elections and pass it as true restrict people's voting rights. They need to stop the insanity and focus on doing the work of the people, investing in health care, child care, education, clean air, clean water, and nutrition. Sincerely, Guadalupe Herringer. That's, that's it. For the, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the call to the audience and ask if any board members wish to respond to a criticism, wish to ask staff to review a matter, or wish to ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. Okay. All right, so we're gonna move on to item 9.1. Ms. Grijalva. Yes, Ms. Shaw. I was just wondering if any of the audience members have a call to the audience, just curious. I believe that the sign out in the front said that we had to, they had to sign up before. Okay, um, in regards to one of the letters, though, I would like to comment, um, you know, I think it's clear that we are not at capacity today. Uh, the chairs do not represent people. And so I wonder if uh, the administration can look into uh, what happens when we aren't at capacity. Um, does the mask policy still stand at our board meetings? because um, it is a little hypocritical that we have a mask policy when there's two people here to watch us and in schools um, after the 28th, um, you know, it will be subject for all of the staff and, and students uh, okay. to have that optional um, policy. So, thank you. Thank you. So I think that that question might be addressed in 9.1 or we can ask it at 9.1 for sure. Um, that That's the next item. It's TUSD COVID-19 Readiness and Response District Update, March 8th through the 22nd. Dr. Trujillo. Yes, President Grijalva, members of the governing board. Uh, doing the duties is uh, Leslie Lenhart uh, to give us uh, the update on um, TUSD's COVID readiness steps in the last few weeks. Ms. Lenhart. Good evening. Uh, great to see everybody in person. It's been a long time. Um, so tonight we'll just have a few items. Gene, next slide, thank you. 
Um, we are going to briefly go over the COVID reporting. Uh, we are going to review where the CDC and Pima County um, community level update. And then we'll talk about some of the uh, promotions and communications we've done around uh, stipends, minimum wage, as well as our COVID protocols. Next slide. So for the COVID reporting, um, as the slide shows, um, over the last uh, month or a couple months actually, um, the numbers of COVID cases have gone down dramatically. Um, as of the week of March 7th, we only had 19 positive cases in our pool testing. Uh, last week, although we did not test schools because schools were not in session, uh, we did test all of our other facilities for those that were interested, and we had zero positive cases. So, um, and overall, our prevalence rate has um, decreased dramatically as well, from almost 3% to down to less than half a, half a percent um, in the last week or so. Next slide. Um, as far as the CDC and as their updates for community level spread, um, as we can see, the most of the country now is green, with some air, uh, which means low um, spread, or yellow in some areas, which is medium. Uh, next slide. Pima County is, um, for our area, is at low, um, which means, or, or the green level. Um, and when in the end of the slide of the presentation, we'll show what the different uh, levels mean. Uh, next slide. Um, when I did this, uh, Pima County had not updated their pages, um, but as of I know I looked over the weekend, um, they are also green on all levels, which means we're at low spread for them. Next slide. Is there specific questions? So I can go ahead and finish. Okay. Um, so next slide. So we'll talk a little bit about the communication since we have had some changes happen. Um, at the last governing board meeting, it was um, approved that we would use this um, chart, which you see on the left, um, depending on community level spread, will determine our masking, um, as well as if required employee testing for those that are not vaccinated. And since we are in the um, low level at this point. Um, it was determined that as of March 28th, unless you all make a change, um, we will not require masks. Masks will be optional um, at all, um, in all classes, at all large events, obviously outdoors. Um, and that has been communicated, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold, um, through, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, through, we've sent it on social media, we've sent emails, we've posted it on our website. Um, Dr. Trujillo had it in his video last week. Um, so it's been shared um, throughout the district, through all our community and our employees. Uh, next slide. And then we also did an update um, on how we communicated the minimum wage and uh, retention and recruitment stipends. Um, so these are the two graphics on the left that you see that we use. Um, and again, these were promoted through social media, on our website, Dr. Trujillo's video, and then we emailed this out to all of our employees so that they are aware. And that is it. Any questions? Board members, any questions? Okay, Dr. Trujillo. Yeah, so uh, as we saw in the presentation, Pima County has now entered a state of low transmission. We did adopt a framework, so the administration is just looking for guidance where we've got a little bit of some conflicting guidance. We did adopt a framework that requires us to kind of activate the masks recommended slash supported slash optional at the green level, but then we also have a governing board direction that masks recommended slash optional slash supported begin on the 28th. So we're just now approaching the governing board to see if you have any wish to adjust uh, the mask policy start date or if you still wish to proceed with the 28th. How do you think um, changing the date now, so we have you know, a short day tomorrow and Thursday and Friday, how do you think um, making that change right here in the middle of the week, is it 
an urgent issue? Are you recommending it? Or are we just saying we adopted the 28th for it to change and let's just... Well, the feedback that we've received from our principals, it's fairly easy to activate. It's just the only uh, hiccup, you know, in the full spirit of transparency and meeting with Leslie is the delivery of the signage. You know, in all right. honesty, the delivery of the signage is going to extend into next week. Will, it, will the signage be delivered by Friday, by Friday or will we still start Monday without signage? I'd have to double check. We've had a hard time getting paper. One of our challenges. Um, and so we know for sure by Monday we'd have them to all the schools. I can't guarantee Friday at this point. Right, but the school day might start Monday without signage anyway. They could, but okay. I'm, I'm hoping not. I mean, that's, that's I'm, we, as of yesterday, we were still waiting for enough paper to be able to print the thousands of signs that we need to go across the district. Okay, board members, questions? Comment, doc, did you have a comment, Dr. Ravi? Sure. Right. Um, yeah, I appreciate the, the question, and I, and I think the signage is probably the least of my concerns at this point. And you know, we, we, we supported starting this on March 28th, you know, regardless. And I think the messaging has already gone out in emails. I've received that as a parent uh, in terms of March 28th. Um, and so I, I think it'll be just more confusing if we change that at this point. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. We'll be ready to go March 28th. Yeah. And I think that if we don't have signage printed by the district, if we can ask our schools, you know, to print it on whatever paper they have, just so they have something up by Monday morning. Absolutely. The graphic is done, so we can, you know, share that with all the schools. If yeah. they'd like to print it out prior, if there is a delay, we can absolutely make sure they okay. have that. Okay. All right. And so, Dr. Trujillo, we're looking at um, the low, one of the things that we talked about is right now, um, well, when we adopted this, medium masks were required in large indoor events. So what we're saying is if we're low starting the, the 28th and that doesn't change, then pretty much masks are optional everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyone have any questions about that? All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're on consent agenda and we oh, have Ms. Oh. Mr. I, I I'm sorry, Ms. Shaw. Yeah, I also apologize. please, um, because it's <laughs> the glare is funky, so if you don't, if I don't call on you, it's just because I didn't see you or my head's on a little pivot here. Go ahead, Ms. Shaw. No worries. Uh, I thought we were going to go over some of the other attachments, uh, specifically uh, Regulation EBR2T. Um, I just have some questions about um, that regulation real quick. Um, it states, and this is about... Um, uh, protocol for classroom or building closures, um, second paragraph, or well, on page four of that document, it reads, in the event of an outbreak within a classroom or at a TUST school or work site, the director of health services or designee will consult with the state or local health department on the closure of school areas or entire schools and will notify the superintendent, regional superintendent, risk management operations, and the communications department on all substantive communications. Um, I would like the governing board to also be included in that communication, please, if we can. Okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Shaw, which attachment were you talking about? Uh, governing board regulation code EBR2T. Okay, hang on. EBR2T, okay. And it's under the protocol for classroom or building closures on page four. Can we add that to the document? Dr. Trujillo? Yeah, President Grijalva, members of the board. The, co the regulation code is just a reflection of the changes brought on by the recent actions taken by the governing board. We have the author here, uh, Mr. Aronoff, uh, to address any questions and, of course, the potential addition of notification to the governing board. Mr. Aronoff? Yes, good evening, members of the governing board, President Grijalva. I, I would have to look back at that specific language. I don't, off the top of my head, see um, a problem with notifying the board when, uh, when that has happened. Um, effectively, what we did in drafting the language was reflect current practices on how communications are happening with state and local health authorities. Um, but. I don't see a, a significant issue with 
changing that so that we can also notify members of the board. Um, we'd be cautious about ongoing communications with, uh, you know, between the board as a whole and the, you know, and the, and the health authorities just because that gets into other issues with uh, open meeting laws. But, um, but as far as getting communication out, I think we can do that. Um, Dr. Trujillo, perhaps it can just come through legal, so there isn't that issue of, you know, or you can just blind copy. What we've been getting is the rolling numbers, mm -hmm. and it just says on the top how many classrooms were closed. Perhaps if we're going to, yeah, if there's an uptick in COVID or something like that. I mean, initially, if we got updates on every class that closed, we... <laughs> Our emails would be inundated there a while there in January, um, but I think now it might be just sort of a, a red flag to let us know that if the conditions are changing. Was that the intent, Ms. Shaw, or just general information? Uh, yes, I, I think that we you know, deserve as a board to know if there is an outbreak or a potential outbreak happening at one of our schools, and you know, yeah. I just wanna prevent like, what happened in January from happening in, for the rest of the school year. Understood. So maybe, and I don't know that it even means that we need to be part of this, like the ongoing communications, but if there is a classroom closer, then we can just be notified by the superintendent. Would that make sense? Because I don't know that I want to be a part of like the back and forth emails between like the health department and everyone else, but I do think notification would be good. Great. I, I, I can make okay. those changes. Okay. And so... This didn't require any vote. This was just an update on procedures. Yeah, regulation but, is not policy. Right, it's, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, okay. Any other questions? Dr. Ravi. Uh, did, you, did you need us to do anything with um, the, the changes to the governing board policy on COVID-19 vaccination testing and face covering? Is that an action that you needed for us tonight? Then there was a redlined uh, document in our... Mr. Ross? Yes, that, that's a good question. Um, Michael and I talked about that um, a couple of times, and basically what we're, we're doing is giving you the opportunity to tell us if you want something different. Otherwise, we're going with the direction that right. you gave previously to make sure that our policies reflect the actions that you take during board meetings, and this would be another example of that. If you recall that, that the board said, yeah, please go ahead and make sure that, that policy reflects what the, the changes we make during board meetings, and, and we did that here. Great, and I think, I think the legal counsel did a good job of reflecting all of the policies that we have adopted as a governing board in this, in this policy. So I don't, if, if you don't need action from us, then I'm, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so just to clarify, provided that our community remains low, then our board meetings next time, there will be, there will be whatever signage is at every school and this will be, we'll be complying with whatever's going on on the campuses. Okay. All right, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, um, one of the documents uh, states that if an employee or a student is or tests positive for COVID um, and then they uh, quarantine for five days and then they return for those remaining five days from the date of their positive test, they're supposed to wear a mask at the school site. And I'm just, um, just wondering, are we including that in the messaging um, that we're putting out to parents and staff about, you know, when they do have to wear a mask. Sorry. No, you're okay. Um, so yes, we uh, have not changed the chart that we developed several weeks ago with you all, uh, which is shared on the website and has been shared with families. So none of that has changed as far as our guidance and how our health, health offices and uh, principals and leaders across the district are interpreting that. Okay, so there isn't any action. This was just a study item. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Ms. Grahalba? Yes, Dr. Ravi. No, uh, thank you, Ms. Leinhardt. I think, you know, it's been really encouraging um, getting the daily reports from you. Um, it was very disencouraging as we went from, you know, the, the low teens and 20s and 30s up to the hundreds of yeah. cases on a daily basis in January <laughs> uh, and seeing the zeros again and you know low ones or twos or the low, low single digits on that um, over the last 
uh, few weeks has been really encouraging. So really, really glad that you know we are where we are, and I think the governing board uh, did a great job uh, at our previous meeting, um, giving the flexibility to our administration to really uh, be nimble, uh, look at those weekly reports from the CDC, uh, and being able to um, to to do what's uh, was more public health related as opposed to, to political related, you know, and and being able to implement. Um, a guidance in the future if numbers were to change over the next few weeks uh, going into the rest of the of the semester and, and I'm um, really glad where we're at right now and you know again as as one of the call to the audience members uh, stated we don't want to let on our guard and I'm glad that we'll still continue to get those numbers and continue uh, being vigilant with the pool testing and other things as a surveillance mechanism to see if things are changing uh, locally uh, as we continue to, to look at what's happening on the, on the county level so that we can the administration can make decisions on, on what to implement based on, on our levels um, and, and what we pass as a governing board. So, so thank you for the governing board and thank you for, for everyone um, in our community for everything you've done to, to really hold to uh, the safety of our, of, our, of our students and teachers and staff and the families they come home to. You know, I'm really curious to see what my daughter's gonna do on Monday, uh, whether she'll be going to school yeah. in the mask or, or what she'll decide uh, Monday morning as a, a fourth grader in our district. Um, and we've had a conversations about this already, as I'm sure all of us have with our, with our um, children, uh, about what this means for our families. Uh, and I'm glad uh, that we're at a place currently uh, in, in our public health that we can you know, make that decisions individually uh, without the consequences more widely. Um, and, so, and so we'll keep on watching this and I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to working with this board and administration to continue keeping our, our schools as safe as possible. Yep, we're definitely trending in the right direction. Okay, um, now we're on consent agenda, or back up to consent agenda. Dr. Trujillo. Yeah, President Grijalva, uh, members of the board, the loan consent agenda item tonight, I'd like to recommend for your approval, uh, consent, agenda, uh, consent agenda item 7.2. Our general counsel is here to answer any questions or concerns regarding this item. Okay, board member, I'll move the item. I'll second. Any, uh, have an, I move the item, Dr. Ravi seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. Sorry. Item passes unanimously. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, now we pulled 8.1, so now we're on 9.2, TUSD Capital Investment Initiative for 22-23 school year. Dr. Trujillo. Yes, President Grijalva, members of the governing board. Tonight represents a bold step meeting the needs of this community, specifically our student body, and the communities that trust us with their kids. For the first time in several years, probably over a decade, we'll be proposing a comprehensive in scope and size bathroom renovation project that will touch every single high school student in the district, something that is long delayed. And it also will be year two of our support of the performance, visual, and fine arts, as well as our interscholastic programs. As you remember, our governing board was generous enough last year to pass a comprehensive financial package for the purchase of instruments, sheet music, uniforms, a lot of the equipment that our performance, visual, and fine arts students as well as our athletes need to be successful. This year in part two, we'll be proposing a capital investment package that will focus on renovating, repairing, and upgrading the places and spaces where our students perform uh, as musicians, as thespians, as dancers, and of course as, as athletes around the district. So, also, we'll be talking about a unique opportunity that we have with the Department of Defense uh, through a grant that's available to support Borman and an opportunity to fund two new classroom complexes over at uh, Borman. So here to walk us all through this, we will have our Director for Facilities, Mr. Greg Meyer, and then our, uh, our Project Coordinator, Mr. Damon Ballesteros. I have asked Renee Weatherless also to provide a um, a detailed summary of our capital funding situation so the board understands very clearly what our capital capacity is for this school year as well as next school year. I've also asked Renee to just give a general, uh, general definition of the expenditure parameters of adjacent ways. Adjacent ways is a um, sort of a quieter fund that we have that's available to address uh, parking lot, uh, entrances, areas of egress, around the district, but Renee will give a little bit more information. So we've added a financial component uh, at the conclusion of this presentation. With that, uh, our operations team 
It's all yours. Good evening, uh, President Grijalva, uh, Governing Board, Dr. Trujillo, Council Ross. Again, thank you this, uh, for this evening, taking the time to allow us to present this capital investment initiative for the 2022-23 school year. Next slide. As Dr. Trujillo had mentioned, uh, the capital funding allocation is extremely vital to launch a comprehensive renovation of bathrooms across the district's high schools, parking lot renovation, repair initiative for schools across the district, and continued building uh, renovation and security, and the proposed renovation and repair of performance arts and interscholastic athletic program venues across the district. In addition, uh, this is in partnership with the United States Department of Defense, the education activity, and the public schools on military installations grant. Uh, Borman K-8 has been placed on an approved priority list to correct and improve the facility's conditions throughout the site and capacity deficiencies throughout the site. This conceptual uh, renovations and building additions has been approved by the United States Department of Defense pending Tucson Unified's 20% project funding match. Um, the funding allocation request will provide the funding match that's necessary to immediately begin uh, the design build transformation there at Borman K-8. Again, this allocation request we seek utilization of available capital funding for the 2022 fiscal year for projects that will be completed during the summer of 2022 and throughout the 22-23 school year. Next slide, please. Again, more specifically, uh, the capital funding request project types, again, uh, they would be the high school renovations of the restrooms, the pavement repair and maintenance, building renovations and security, fine arts, interscholastic sports, and the Borman K-8 renovation and building additions. Next slide, please. More specifically, uh, for the high school restroom renovations, we took a look at a comprehensive uh, analysis of new urinals, toilets, sinks, faucets, steel urinal and stall partitions, flooring, ceilings, wall tile, LED lighting, painting, minor plumbing repair on the exteriors, wall repair, and hand dryers. Next slide, please. Next slide. On the building renovations and security, it's gonna be a continued investment into our building renovations throughout the district. Security fencing and gates, intercom updates and cameras uh, at our high schools. Next slide. For our pavement repair and maintenance program, we're taking a look at uh, addressing and and repairing and patching and cracking parking lots throughout the district and taking a look at uh, resurfacing uh, opportunities uh, depending on the existing condition of the pavement structure and that either goes a seal coat, a liquid PMM chip seal or a complete milling overlay and new restriping um, throughout these parking lots identified. Next slide. For our fine arts, we took a look at the FCI and comprehensive analysis that had been done previously and took a look at auditorium stages, dance rooms, stage curtains, and audio video. And again, took a look at our FCI scores and put together this list uh, based on the scores and the need throughout the sites. Next slide. Our interscholastic sports is taking a look at mainly our fields, uh, gyms, and locker rooms, specifically our fields, and taking a look at the surface that the kids play on um, and really addressing those needs with our interscholastic sports. Excellent. And finally, the capital funding request is requesting the Borman K-8 
funding allocation for the school transformation there at Borman. Uh, what you see here are a few renderings that our design team has come up with in our packet presentation to the Department of Defense. Um, we show there the, a new main entrance, um, new gym and cafeteria and kitchen area, and then just some classroom space. There's going to be a, a whole new wing uh, added with uh, six to eight new classrooms, as well as the existing space being completely renovated uh, and redesigned and constructed uh, as well. Uh, this transformation can be seen more specifically on a 3D rendering. If you take a look at that QR code, you can take a look at a 3D model and aerial of the site as we had proposed and presented to the Department of Defense. This PSMI grant uh, that we had uh, applied to has been in the works for approximately 31 months, um, just providing documentation on the facilities condition index on the base, partnering with our base uh, and the base commander and everyone on the base. The current cost estimate for the project is approximately 26, 26 and a half million dollars. The PSMI grant funding request is an 80-20 split with 20% coming from Tucson Unified, the local agency, and the remaining 80% coming from the Department of Defense. Next slide. In total, um, we've broken out uh, and took a look at each individual section. Our restroom renovation project uh, is gonna run approximately 11.5 million. And what we did there is we took a look at our AutoCAD plans and identified each individual restroom stall space and put costs associated to those, 11.5 million. Our building renovations and security is in line with our uh, multi-year facilities plan and our FCI scores. Uh, our pavement repair and maintenance for a million is also consistent with our multi-year facilities plan and the uh, pavement scores out at each site. Our fine arts request for a million um, interscholastic sports for 1.4 and Borman this shows the 3.3 uh, million for the renovation the total 20% cost for the Borman project is approximately 5.3 total capital request including the total for Borman would be approximately 22 million okay I'm sorry so the renovation in addition for Borman, we have 3.3, but you said it's five? So the total is five. Well, we began the process um, over 30, 30 months ago. There was an initial $2 million that was committed, um, and that's why I did not include it there. In speaking with Renee, she said to definitely bring that up because it's a total commitment of $5.3 million. That's our 20% match. And, and the project is 26 million? Yes. Okay, I see. Okay, board members, questions? Uh, Ms. Shaw, and then Ms. Luna Rose. Thank you, President Grijalva, and thank you, sir, for the presentation. Um, I'm so glad that we're gonna be able to tackle some of these issues that we've been having at the school, and especially um, be able to improve the Borman uh, campus. Um, so I have a couple questions. One is um, how long for these improvements to be completed? Um, and then also in regards to the bathroom renovations, uh, does that factor in uh, the creation of gender neutral bathrooms for those uh, campuses that don't have like a centrally located one already? Right, so uh, in regards to the Borman question, you know, we, we uh, definitely have been partnering with uh, the Department of Defense and we are at a process right now and a point in time to where the approval has been given for us to move forward pending uh, the budget uh, commitment from the district. In regards to the restroom renovations, 
what we took a look at is our existing AutoCAD files. So we did not break out independently gender uh, specific. We just took a look at the existing plans to come up with a conceptual cost estimate based on the number of urinals, stalls, and toilets and sinks and hand dryers that were on our AutoCAD files uh, at each site. We did that and then we matched it by visiting each site to confirm those numbers. Okay, um, uh, Clerk Linda Rose. Right. Okay, go ahead. Am I on? Okay, sorry. Um, Mr. Ballesteros, thank you so much for the presentation. Yes. Um, so I just wanna first say I'm, I'm very excited. Part of the reason why, some of the reason why I wanted to be on the board was to start looking at capital projects. I, when my daughter was at Sewell, I was the site council president and booster club president. And parents would pull me aside and say, have you happened to walk into the girls' bathroom or the boys' bathroom? And so to, to, to see this in front of me tonight, I, and, um, I think is um, something that's uh, really needed. Um, it, it also does wonderful for, you know, we have beautiful bathrooms and schools and campuses that people are gonna wanna send their children to. So, so thank you for your work on this. Um, I did wanna follow up with Ms. Shaw's questions about the gender neutral um, restrooms. I know that this, as you said, this was just for capital projects. And I think I had, uh, or just for what we had right now. And I think I had mentioned it to Dr. Trujillo a couple months ago. Um, what would be the next step in something like that? Dr. Trujillo. Yeah, so Mr. Meyer, uh, I engaged Mr. Meyer on a separate project a couple months uh, ago, right, right before we went to break. That's actually a parallel project that's gonna require different renovations in terms of you know, what Mr. Ballesteros is talking about are the existing bathrooms and sort of renovating existing spaces. Mr. Meyer, who can give you a little bit more detail, is talking about going into each campus bathroom and actually reconfiguring existing bathrooms to make them gender neutral so that every okay. high school at least has one space that's in a general student common area so our students don't have to uh, inadvertently out themselves or distinguish themselves by going into the nurse's office or staff areas. So that's a parallel project that Mr. Meyer, I'd be happy to bring you up if you wanna to speak to some of that work. Yes, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, in regard to that, uh, that's uh, very true. Uh, Dr. Trujillo asked me to go ahead and take a look at this. So what we've done so far is I had a meeting with the assistant superintendents and to, uh, I guess, go through the process that we could use for this. And we decided that we would try to uh, address the high schools first so what we're looking at right now is basically the CAD drawings for all of the high schools and taking a look at all of those restrooms to determine where would be the best spot for the general uh, neutral restrooms to go and so that that is where we're at right now and I think the only high school that that we still have a few questions on is Tucson High because of how large it is and making sure that we have got all of our bases covered there so uh, once we got that determined, then we can start, uh, I guess, having more conversations directly with the principals and get their input on that because they're in the schools every day. They have a good idea of where it would be probably the best for uh, those restrooms to be, but that's really where we're at right now. So it is a separate project, but we're definitely looking at it. So it was good that you brought it up so that I could at least give you a summary of where we're at. So, but we'll uh, proceed with that. Thank you. And Dr. Trujillo, you can bring that back to the board once the project is a little yes. more moved along. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's mainly our point here is we wanted to make sure everybody understands those are two separate goings on. Mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely something that we're working with our principals on in terms of location of the bathroom. So essentially, um, our high schools are gonna have to seat over one bathroom uh, that will now be designated as gender neutral. And that of course requires a more comprehensive reconfiguration uh, that we'll make sure that Mr. Meyer, you come on back uh, with a little bit more of a timeline and cost okay. associated. So uh, our anticipation of that one is that work will probably be funded out of fiscal year 23's capital, uh, which is coming at us effective July 1, but the planning stages are, are already happening. Okay. All right. Did you have, I have another one more question? question? Yeah. Yes, it's okay. Um, and Mr. Byers, so thank you, Mr. Okay, Meyer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, just out of curiosity, um, just because I'm looking at the pavement repair and maintenance, 
um, due to the current oil market volatility, do we know, do they change daily, weekly? So I, we've, uh, I obtained during the first uh, two weeks of the assessment, uh, three different quotes and with our vendors and each vendor stated that they were assuming that we were gonna start within the next week. And I said, no, I'm presenting to the governing board and I need some cost estimates. They're like, for that, it, the market changes sometimes on a daily basis. We can't give you a quote because it's not gonna be valid a week from now, much less a few days from now. And they said, we have a standard uh, item that we place on all of our cost estimates. It basically says due to the market, oil market volatility, I mean, we can't really hold prices right now. Uh, and I, we're hoping that over time this is gonna change. So they really said, we really cannot give you a quote because it's not gonna be valid uh, one week, much less a few days from now. Okay, thank you. I was just curious, thank you. Um, I was looking at the list for the fine arts and I don't see holiday on the list. So I'm wondering if, um, if there's specific items that we're funding with this project or a reason why Holiday isn't on the list. Mr. Basteros, my understanding is you went by FCI score? That is correct. Okay. So we did a, uh, this was based off of the FCI and a fine art study that was done with uh, Joan Ashcraft and she provided a comprehensive spreadsheet that uh, showed all the sites and the needs with scores based on it. And we took a look at the ones in most need and identified those. Okay. Maybe if we can ask um, the principals to reach out to assistant principals with specifics because that was done, when was that done? The Two years ago, the fine arts. 2019. 2019. 2019. And so by now, <laughs> Some of the things that might have been okay, <laughs> maybe aren't. And so um, just, I mean, as one board member, I know that our resources are finite, but we do want to support our fine arts in our schools and make sure that everyone has a nice place to practice. And, sure. yeah. um, and I, it makes sense to me that the larger portion of the resources are going to some of our bigger campuses or maybe campuses that have been neglected. But um, I also want to make sure that we're supporting our our schools that have the magnet status or the, you know, yeah. the draw for fine arts. Sure. Yes, I, Dr. I, I will say that being a magnet, they have access to another funding source that we can look yeah. at for their capital needs. We definitely DSEG capital um, that we can look at for holiday. But a, as you just said, the spirit of regular district MNO is really taking a look at those schools that don't draw down the magnet funding or DSEG. Okay. But that doesn't but, mean that we can't leverage our DSEG capital to meet the needs of those magnet schools and our USP. Right, uh, because Ross Grouge is on here, Tucson yes, High is yes. on here, so yes. we do have some other magnets that are on here. Yeah. So just, I mean, to bring it up, um, and Carrillo, obviously, because if I don't mention them, I'll hear about it later. <laughs> so, okay, any other questions, concerns? All right. We're getting uh, a oh. presentation from Ms. Weatherless. So yeah, I was yes. gonna say, uh -huh. we'd like to give Ms. Weatherless Absolutely. some time here. Thank you, Mr. Ballesteros. Thank you. Good evening, President Grijalva, members of the Governing Board, Dr. Trujillo, Council Ross, and staff. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick look on where our capital funding sits. Um, next slide, please. So on the left-hand side is a look at this year. So fiscal 21-22, um, in the format that we're looking at is what our current revenue for the year is at the top, our expenditures to date, and encumbrances. So if you're looking um, at the chart, we have a total of $22 million in revenue for this year. As of today, we've spent 12.6 million, meaning we've paid all the bills, and we have in the system POs and encumbrances to the tune of 5.8 million. So if we make the assumption that no more spending is done between now and June 30, then we would be spending a total of 18.4 million in capital. That would leave excess revenue of 3.6. Now, when we're dealing with capital budget limits, you take those numbers and you add in the money that we carried over from prior year. That's the 11.3 at the bottom. 
So we would be carrying forward at the end of this fiscal year almost $15 million. So if you look at our projections, now these are based on estimates. We obviously don't have the, the final budgets from the state yet, but based on um, being fully funded with capital, we're looking at approximately the same revenue level of $22 million. Now, here's where the assumptions start. We say, if we just take our current spending level of 18.4 million and assume that's going to be repeated, I plugged in for tonight's conversation the $20 million that was originally on this, but we know that's supposed to be $22 million for, for Borman. That would create, um, if you include 22, that would take those total expenditures, not just to 38, but about 40 million, which means that we would be exceeding the current year revenue. Okay, but we would be carrying over almost 15 million from 22 into next year. So the bottom line is if, if we do spend at that level of 38 to $40 million, then we would be exceeding all budget capacity in fiscal 23. So do you have any questions? Mr. Dr. Ravi. So uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Weatherless, uh, for this slide here. So the $18.4 million, that includes some one-time uh, expenses that we approved, some of the interscholastics and fine arts and some other things. And is that, is that correct? Or where do you get the 18 from four in terms of next year's spending levels? Like, because there's a lot of one-time expenses that we approved this year already. There are, there, and there was a lot of um, approvals that you did in the fall for one for grounds, one for the 10 million in facilities. So we took a look at what's in the 18. I would estimate two to three million is non-repeating out of that number. Because we haven't completed oh, that many of those approved dollars yet. We're gonna have to carry them over into next year. Hmm. Dr. Trujillo. Uh, I will say, Renee, this is exclusive also of m and carry forward, right? And so the it's board, just capital. This is, is just right. capital. So the yes. board is, is still dealing with its 28 million carry forward on the m and side of the house. Correct. Um, so just wanted to be clear that we're talking about your capital. And if we approve all of these projects, uh, like Dr. Shaw said, we look at non-repeating expenses, mm -hmm for the FY2 spending level, understanding that the funding for the projects that have not been completed has to carry across to the next fiscal, you're saying that there's two to three million in non-repeating funds that may be available out of that 18.4? Correct. Possibly, okay. Yes. Which puts their ending capital at the end of FY23, uh, right around three and a half, maybe four million. If we're going off of your slide. Off of the slide, the ending capital at the end of 23 is in the negative. So if you took that two to three million and you said, uh, we're not gonna repeat that in 23, that would put that in the black. However, that means the newly approved projects we just did in December need to still be accounted for. Okay. So there is still about six to seven million dollars of that that we would need to also account for. So the red number there, 1.5? Mm -hmm. You're saying that's, in order to cover that. In order to cover that, yeah. we would have to, uh, we, we could move over, carry over from m and into capital to cover it. That would be mm -hmm. one option. Or you would have to reduce the amount of approval, approved spending. Can you review the m and situation with the board and the public? That's a previous slide. Sure. I don't know if you put it up. No, yeah. I just gave the capital for tonight. Oh, okay. okay. Um, but as of, Mid-March, looking at the numbers, we are looking at um, carrying over about $28 million of m and and that's factoring in all of the pre-encumbrance for vacancies that we have been showing every month. That's assuming we're just not gonna spend it. Um, so it's likely that we would be carrying over well over $20 million at the end of this year. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't see any, the only thing that, um, you know, I take a pause and I understand that Borman will be getting a brand new campus. And so um, it looks, I mean, it looks amazing and students deserve it, but it's hard to spend, you know, 5 million, 5.2 million on one campus when we're trying to stretch a million dollars over, you know, 10 campuses. So um, that's the only thing that's causing me pause, but it's difficult to 
not make the investment when 80% of it is getting covered. So uh, I just had to say that. <laughs> um, Dr. Robbie. Right. No, thank you for this. This wasn't included in our original board packet. I know I asked for this presentation to be added to the, tonight's meeting so that we can see where the funding is coming from. There was something in, um, in somewhere I read in terms of the adjacent ways uh, as a funding source or something. And so can we get more explanation about what that means? Uh, and then also wanted to touch back with uh, administration on what is the recommended action tonight. I'm hesitant on taking an action that leaves us in a deficit, um, especially when we have a lot of um, negotiations with the unions and other things that we're currently in, in discussion with about what the, some of the MNO carry forward might be used for uh, and how much we really have going into future years. So I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant on that tonight. I don't know if there's some immediate action we need on, on Borman or, or any of the other projects to get things going because there is other funds on the table that we don't want to lose or or, or sit on too long before your projects get more expensive. So like a recommendation from administration of what I would actually like us to take tonight. We've got recommendations ready, but before I would like to throw it over to Renee to talk, give a little bit of an overview of adjacent ways okay. and what the expenditure parameters are for those funds. Um, so adjacent ways is its own separate funding source. Um, right now we're currently at about $1.7 million available balance. Now those monies are included in property tax, they're collected through those payments. And then the projects that get approved, um, might ask Mr. Valesteros has come up, but we have to submit those proposals to the school facility, it's not called the SFB anymore, but the school facility board prior to um, starting any of those projects. But it is, um, as was mentioned, ingress, egress. So anything that's connected to the city entrances onto our property. Um, occasionally, and I think we had talked about some of those parking and pavement, those kinds of projects may or may not qualify for adjacent ways. It just depends on where it is, what it's for, um, if it's just due to wear and tear and, and regular maintenance, we can't use that funding source. So there is a separate approval process for anything that we use those um, funds for. But it is also a cash funding source. Um, and as I said, I would suspect if we don't spend any of that 1.7 by the end of the year, we would be about $2 million. And so all the $20 million that are proposed, did any of them come from adjacent ways? Or was all of it capital? So of the, uh, of the 20 million that were uh, for the entire packet, the 1 million that has been identified per pavement repair, I would anticipate approximately two to three of those projects potentially qualifying for uh, adjacent ways. And the manner is in the presentation and the details that we provide uh, the State Facilities Board um, for, those, for those monies. I have more comments and questions. I think I'm going to wait for administration to, to make the recommendations and, and talk more about that, President Grahava. Okay, thank you. Ms. Shaw. Thank you. Um, you know, if we're hesitant about what might happen in school year 23, I wonder if we could uh, pause the uh, repaving so that the deficit is not so great because you know paving our parking lots isn't really a student-centered uh, need. Um, and I do think that we, we should move forward with the Borman renovations, uh, the students and families at Borman, since it is on the Davis Malvin Air Force Base, you know, they're under a unique, um, a unique stress that most of our school campuses are not. Uh, some of those family members, um, you know, um, okay. give their lives to our country. And so uh, when touring the campus, uh, especially the area for the middle school, it was clear that they needed a lot of, of renovation. There was a flood issue that happened um, where the, you know, if you've been there, it's like, there's an outdoor area that leads into the hallway and it flooded at one point. Uh, the library was flooded and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not really appropriate, some of the, um, the facilities over there. And there's also an ADA concern uh, student who was in a wheelchair, uh, has difficulty getting to the playground and throughout the school. And so uh, those renovations are needed. Thank you. Yep. Um, I, Dr. Trujillo? I, I'm comfortable moving forward. I think that, you know, using some of our carry forward if we need to, 
in m and is for these projects is really important. <coughs> and it is, a lot of this is deferred because, you know, we, we move, we historically didn't do maintenance. And so now it costs a lot more. <laughs> Once you defer it, it costs a lot more. So Dr. Trujillo. Our recommendation is to move forward in its entirety. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have a, a, a second option if that's not the ideal. But the reason our recommendation is to move forward in its entirety is the entire purpose of capital and carry forward is to fund one-time expenses. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can use our carry forward dollars and quite frankly our capital dollars to address one-time expenses, number one, we're taking care of a lot of a deferred maintenance before it gets more expensive. And then it becomes less of an issue. Uh, there's less pressure to see those dollars laying around and start throwing them into recurring expenses. So we always like the one-time purchase. We always like the usage of capital and, and, uh, and carry forward funds towards capital purchases for that reason. So our number one recommendation is to pass it. It's entirely uh, in line with uh, board member Shaw's statements. I don't think that there's a better way to say thank you for those families that have served our country than to invest in Borman. Mm -hmm. I also think it's going to increase enrollment capacity for the school. We're gonna make those funds back. Uh, in terms of the additional capacity for the additional student enrollment at the school. And I think that <clears throat> if it's not the pleasure of the board to move forward totally tonight, which also is understandable, uh, I would look at more of a phased approach for that restroom renovations and, and break that up into two years and do half of the high schools now and then try to fund them uh, in the next fiscal year to get the remainder of the bathrooms. We would certainly go off of FCI uh, to make the process clean. We could defer the pavement uh, repair and maintenance uh, for maybe looking at a year when we have a little bit more adjacent ways funding to deal with that. Uh, and now my understanding is the adjacent ways will be entirely, that million dollars will be entirely funded from adjacent ways or we're pitching in a million? That, that funding is independent of adjacent Independent ways. of adjacent ways. Adjacent okay. ways we have to submit yeah. uh, our plans and details and designs for that independent funding. Yeah, so th that, that would be our, our backup plan. Uh, again, the phase down of the, of the restroom re renovation, maybe the delay of the pavement repair. So option A for us, recommendation A, pass it. It's entirely uh, option B. We would propose phasing in our, rest our high school restroom renovation project across two fiscal years, probably save an additional five million to keep it in the capital bank and possibly defer pavement repair and maintenance, which would give an additional six million uh, on the capital side. Um, I would prefer to move forward in its entirety. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and move that as, as presented. I'll second. Thank you. I have a motion to second. Um, Dr. Ravi. Yeah, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm not gonna vote in favor of that tonight. I think um, I'm, I'm okay with uh, approving some of this tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, especially the Borman project with other funds available. But I'm, I, I think there's some more research that needs to be done. I think I'd like this to come back in two or three weeks, rather, at the next governing board meeting um, with more information on the financial side, like what is able to move into um, uh, adjacent ways from the 20 million, what is the more protections on, on the spending levels of that 18.4 million, what's gonna be non-recurring that we can take off and really get a good sense. And also, Dr. Tariya, you're mentioning that uh, there's other bathroom renovations in the general neutral bathrooms that are gonna be in the capital for next year, then we don't have any money left over for that the way it's presented right now. Um, and so I, I would really ask the governing board to hold off on voting for the entire package tonight until we get more information and know exactly what we're voting for. And, and also in terms of the M&O carry forward, I, I have a lot of concerns that I've expressed about uh, how much of that's gonna be left over based on uh, other other things that we've already approved uh, as a governing board in terms of salaries and, and uh, reoccurring costs over the next few years, uh, along with um, what is gonna be coming up in terms of step increases and other things that are being negotiated with the unions currently. And so I would really ask the governing board not to approve the whole package. I would rather us approve part of it tonight uh, and have the administration come back with more information in the next governing board meeting. I, I understand your concern, Dr. Ravi. I I feel that some of these projects, though, are, um, I mean, they're really needed. In our, and, and for us to be able to go through the process, get procurement involved, hopefully do some of these projects over the summer when students aren't as impacted, 
makes sense to me. Um, in our budget, you know, 1.5 million is not um, is not going to break the bank. And so I would like uh, to move forward with this. And then obviously we monitor these projects. And if, you know, there's something that comes back, I mean, there's an estimated cost for a million dollars for paving. If that's something that we want to hold off on, but you know, we could, we get complaints. I get complaints all the time of parents and students who are driving on our campuses and you know do damage to their vehicles. This isn't it isn't just about the staff that are there. It's everyone that's visiting a campus. And some of these some of these um, these uh, pavement and um, pavement repairs are really critical. Some of the schools that I visited, um, it's. I mean, some of our the front of our buildings look abandoned because none of our none of our staff will park in the parking lot because it's it's pretty bad. And so, and visitors, it it just um, I just think that we I would I would like to move forward on this. I understand your concern, but I do think that we can um, make the commitment and get procurement involved in making the purchases and putting through the paperwork that they need to for this. Um, for what's needed for these projects. President Grijalva. Um Ms. Luna Rose and oh, then Dr. Robbie. Okay. Um, and actually, this, my question is more to Dr. Robbie. Um, so what would, you, what would your suggestion be? Like, what would you like to see, like, us take a vote tonight if it's not the full package? Well, I appreciate that. I, I think the Borman um, uh, additions uh, is something that we can approve tonight, especially with the, uh, this is only 20% of the money that will be going into this project, and so we have the other funds committed by the Department of Defense, and so moving forward with that, and I, I, I think I can get behind a couple of million of bathroom renovations, I think, to get the process started, um, but, but approving a $20 million package when we see us in the red here, you know, $22 million of estimated revenue is probably fixed, if not going down, depending on enrollment, and, and unless something magical happens in the state level, it's probably not going to be going up. But what we can anticipate is that $20 million of, of capital proposals is probably going to be a lot higher by 10%, 20% higher than $20 million when, when it's all said and done because of the increase in cost and inflation and, and, and materials going up. You know, I, you, you, we all hear stories of people building houses and doing things where their wood costs are going up on a weekly basis, and so all this is going to be going up over the next six to 12 months and not going down. Well, our revenue is not going to be going up probably unless something changes in the state level. So I, 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 can, I can definitely get behind improving a certain amount tonight, but I, I, I cannot support $20 million when, when we have a slide up here showing us in, in, in the red uh, on that. Okay. Ms. Shaw, we have a motion in a second, and so I'm not sure if we have a majority or if we need to do some work. I'm comfortable moving forward with this tonight. Okay. Ms. So we'll go ahead and, um, and, and I appreciate what you're saying, Dr. Ravi. I just think that it's going to be difficult for me to go through this list of restrooms and say, okay, let's pick out which schools don't get one. Um, same with some of the other expenditures. These are all really significant needs. It's not something like, you know, a coat of paint and it'll be fine. They're, they're, they're fairly extensive. Um, no, no, I agree. I mean, they're all extremely important needs. I just, we have a fiduciary responsibility as a board also to, in terms of how we spend our money right. and resources. So that's my only hesitation. I, no, I, I, I don't disagree that these all things are, are, should be happening, but making sure that we do this in a responsible way. Yeah, I agree. Dr. Trujillo. Just make sure that the board has all the information before it, it, it does vote. Um, to be very, very specific, it, this is going to require the movement of some of your M&O carry forward, moving over to the capital side uh, to cover the gap. And I believe, Renee, it's going to be close to $10 million on the carry-forward side for M&O. Um, yes. So first start on this slide, it shows a negative 1.5. But okay. that's only listed at 20. And we talked about Borman being 5, not 3, point, not three million. So this would be a negative 3.5. Where the other 7 comes from are all the projects approved yeah. back in December that aren't going to be done by June 30. They're going to need to be carried over. So that's where the total of 10 would need to be moved out of M&O to cover all of this. That's a very different number than the 1.5. Yeah. So that's yes. not in the encumbrances? That's why I wanted to no. make sure. No, it is not in the encumbrances. Oh, that's a, that's a lot of money. That's a, that's different, that's a significant yes. number. So I, I mean, that is some, I mean, that takes up, that would leave us what in carry forward? 14? That's going to leave you, if you move the additional 10, it's going to leave you 18. 18. 
18. You're going to be at 18, and that's before we deal with salary and compensation and yeah, the negotiations. Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, that changes the game for me because um, I feel like we need to have we need to have all of that done. I mean, if we're going to be tapping that much into M and O, we need to have we need to have a holistic look at the budget. 1.5, I didn't have an issue with. Yeah, but I. My understanding was it was the 1.5, but then getting a little bit more information from Renee, yeah. I wanted to break in yeah. because no, those I projects weren't reflected in the encumbrances, and you needed to know that. And, and uh, see, the the problem that I have is if we're we're providing resources to every campus, right. almost every campus is touched. Um, it makes it makes the other. I, I appreciate the needs at Borman, but it's difficult to make those kind of decisions and commit 5.5 when we're picking and choosing which schools are so bad that they need the assistance. And I hear very clearly from the board that there is um, an interest in moving forward. I just don't know how to break this up. Do you have a suggestion, Dr. Trujillo? I do. Um, if, if there's one thing that we do want to walk out with, uh, first of all, anything we walk out with tonight is, we love it. Uh, our job was to bring the entire package, get as much as we could. Um, if there's one thing that we want to move forward with because it's an investment in the future and it's going to, number one, support the family needs of the base and produce and increase the, the um, incoming revenue coming out of uh, Borman with increased enrollment, it's Borman. You know, we would ask for that uh, to go ahead and move forward. We would also ask that because if I look at what we brought forward and sort of what's the most absolute crucial, it's been the bathrooms. The bathrooms we've been getting beat up for several years. I would like to get at least phase one going. Uh, if we can carve out at least a couple of million uh, to try to maybe get some of that work done. And I, we would literally start with the heaviest and I think the most transparent thing to do and the fairest thing to do is to start with the most heavily populated high schools in the district. They gotta go first. We're talking about places like Tucson High Choya, Pueblo, RUHS. We have gotta get them going. And that, that would be my, my request is let's, let's look at those four schools. Let's get a start with those bathrooms and let's do Borman and then maybe we just hold. Mr. Ballesteros, what would that estimate be if we're talking about having to pick apart those schools? So as Dr. Drew had mentioned, if we go uh, with the restroom renovations in a phased approach um, and do maybe a top three um, and then phased approach, uh, the next three in the next fiscal, and then another three in the next fiscal. Uh, restrooms, uh, the, the top three would be Tucson, High, Rincon, and Pueblo. That would be approximately about 4.2 million. Yeah. So that's a reduction of about 7.3 million just in the restroom renovations. Can we also include Choya? I would ask to include Choya as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we do the top four? So if we did the top four, that would be? Five. Approximately 5.3. 5 5.3. Which would be a savings of about six, uh, 6.2 million. Well, and those other, those other schools need it too. <laughs> so that's the problem. Um, President Galva? Yeah, Dr. Ravi. Yeah, and I don't think we know, I don't think we need a phase in report per se, and I don't, know that we need to not approve it this year for the next fiscal year. I just think we can approve some stuff tonight, revisit this in a couple of weeks, make sure we have all the information and what we can approve for next year. I think we can definitely do more next year than just the $5.3 million in the bathroom and the three or four or five million dollars on, on Borman. But I, I think in terms of I think we need more information. I think I think we need to do a better financial so, presentation here to get okay. exactly what we're approving and not approving. I, I understand. So if we do like a phased in for the restroom renovations and instead of 11.5, we approve 5.3. Oh my gosh, let's see. It's like six. 6.2 million dollar yeah. savings. Okay, so, but what is the total capital request? The total capital request would I mean, drop total, to total. 16, uh, 16 million. No, because there's seven already encumbered and we have another two. I just wanna make sure that we yeah. We know the full picture. I'd like to turn it over to Renee and do two things. Number one, uh, get the, the bill for yeah. the four high schools and for Borman. And then if you can re-broadcast um, the graphic with our capital situation and give the board an updated balance of what they can expect. 
okay. if they approve this expenditure here. And specifically, what's not been encumbered and what needs to be funded next year. That's huge. Okay. All right. So on the right-hand side of that chart, where you're looking at 18.4, we talked about two to three of non-repeating. So um, we have seven million dollars of the projects that were approved in, de in December that we are not expecting to be spent this year. So that would be a total of $22 million needed on what you have already approved. If you approve the four schools, that's a total of 5.4 million. Borman is 5.3. So that would be 10.7. You'd be looking at 32.7 million of spending. You, that would leave us uh, an excess revenue over expenditures of a negative 10. We're going to carry forward almost 15. It would leave a positive balance of about five. But you said there was another 10 million not reflect, or five million not reflected on here. No, that was already taken that's, into you took account. That into account. Mm -hmm. So that's five million. So can we add in fine arts and building renovation security? I mean, those are really big issues. Mm -hmm. Security and fine arts, those are, those are some pretty significant needs. I would like to have more carry forward, obviously, but I also would like us to be able to start the procurement process for these, what we need. Well, I think the heart of our strategy is always to press the board to use any carry forward that it has on both the MNO side of the house and capital, towards capital, one-time purchases. So we're gonna press to get that done we're gonna take a look at our financial situation when enrollment comes in in the fall. And if we're still anywhere north of 18, 19 million, of course, after we do compensation, we're gonna be pressing the board for more capital uh, because that's where we like to spend our carry forward dollars. I think Dr. Shaw is at a place where we're kind of at where you know, we're gonna try again. We're gonna see what our situation is like closer to the 40th day. Anything that doesn't get approved tonight, we're still gonna be coming back. I do think that bathrooms are a huge priority. I think both renovating the existing bathrooms and creating safer places uh, for our students who don't identify as, as necessarily binary male or female, those are important. And so we can get the 10 million tonight. We're gonna have a $5 million carry forward ready for next fiscal year and the board always has the option to add to that uh, from the MNO side of the house. Okay. I really would like to see a priority for the fine arts, sports, and our building renovations and security come back. If, okay. Like right after we get um, our other discussion. So it's, it's pretty painful to leave that there. Ms. Grijalva. Yes, Ms. Luna Rose. So um, I, I kind of want to get this straight as I'm listening to all the discussion. So if we're just well, I guess that's more Dr. Trujillo. So we're looking at Tucson High, Rincon, UHS, Pueblo, Choya as the most immediate need um, to kind of get us started. Is that what we're at? Is that what you're asking of us? Yes, the top four most heavily populated high schools okay. uh, to at least get that work going. And then, of course, the work at Borman, which is, of course, time sensitive. Uh, and so, just, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Shaw, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would also like us to add in uh, the football field at Pueblo. I know we've had ongoing conversation from the calls to the audience about uh, like the locker rooms, the boiler, um, and then most recently I received an email about uh, the football field and how it's hazardous to the players uh, because the grass is so patchy that uh, they often injure themselves playing and so um, I think that school campus really needs some help when it comes to uh, interscholastic. So if we could add that, I think it's 350000 for Pueblo's football field. Um, thank you, Ms. Shaw. The other question I had is about, you said that some of the projects that are already committed. So if schools have already put in requests for cameras or things that are listed here, but... Um, but they've already done their due diligence to get estimates and that kind of thing. That's not included in this funding, right? That's, that is correct. Okay, so because so, there are some, 
still some outstanding projects that haven't been started. And that's what you're saying with the taking that into account, the seven, seven million that you're taking into account because some of the projects that are listed here, I think have already gone through a process and are just waiting to get going. I mean, there's the, they've already been budgeted. So none of that funding has been swept, any of that, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so see the interscholastic sports has Pueblo's football, Choya's football, that's all 1,400. Um, and those needs are pretty great too. President Grijalva? Yes, Dr. Ravi. And I'm not sure how much money is left in ESSER after the bonus, but I thought we were gonna do some of the bathroom renovations from the ESSER funding as well. And so I'm not sure if that's still in play. That's what I thought. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Yeah, uh, do you wanna deliver the news? I think that mm -hmm. for I'll be able to fund that after the stipends. Yeah, after the oh. stipends, I think that we're gonna to need to come back and look at what our plans will be for, t for fiscal 24, because we'll have to, to regroup and see what we have left on balances. Oy. So where are we? We're on. Well, I'll just say that we really appreciate um, any decision that you make tonight. None of this is easy. Our job is to get as much as we can, um, but everything is of high need. I think you can make a great case for everything. I don't think that there are, there would be any disappointment in any approval tonight from this administration or from the employees and the students that you serve. Literally anything that you vote for tonight is gonna address an area of high need, whether it's fixing parking lots that people are tired of tripping over, or the bathrooms that the students are tired of crowding into, or fixing stages, or you know, taking a look at the needs of Foreman. I think everything, any vote tonight, any approval of any pieces of this package is a win for the district. Um, are any of these projects, because um, I know that we have had, as Ms. Shaw mentioned, um, some very specific concerns about um, Pueblo's football field. Have we had, is there any movement on repairing that aside from this funding or this, this it requires this amount of funding? It, it requires a full resizing. Mm -hmm. The crown is non-existent. There's a 2% crown that's needed. The irrigation um, is functioning at probably 50%. And then you do have the patches of sod that are now being overtaken by um, pretty much buffalo grass and weeds. But the biggest component is a 2% crown on the field. And so this isn't artificial turf? We're no, it's sod. And how much is artificial turf significant? Artificial turf is gonna be about another 600,000. I wish we could do that. And the bigger, uh, the additional costs associated with the artificial turf is gonna be really the underground drainage system that's gonna need to be designed because yeah. you're changing the infiltration rate uh, from sod to turf. Yeah. Um, I appreciate um, your suggestion, Ms. Shaw. I get, my problem is I think if we're gonna dedicate funding, I would rather dedicate it to space where more students have access. I mean, not that I don't think that there are high needs everywhere, but I'd rather dedicate more funding to the to our fine arts, just because yes. I think more students might be able to utilize it. Not to say that I there again. The problem is, is that you're you're giving us a list of really high needs. We you have a board that visits campuses a lot, and we've all been able to see that the need is great everywhere. You can so, probably add to the list. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I probably could. Um, Ms. Luna Rose and then Ms. Shaw and then Dr. Ravi and then I think we need to make a decision. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Grijalva. So um, I'm not to say that, I mean, all of these are needed and, you know, the fine arts would wrap into the fine arts package that we voted for a couple months ago. Um, but my, if I were to want to add something to, you know, for tonight would be the pavement repair and maintenance because good lord if you have not been to the Vale parking lot i mean i it's awful um and i'm sure that can be said about all of these that are listed right now i mean it's i don't even drive in the parking lot i mean there's there's just no, no way that i'm doing it and, and 
I know that there are parents who, who crowd the side, and so, and that's right off of Cray, Craycroft and between Broadway and 22nd. So, I mean, it's it's those type of projects that I feel like you know they they add to the beauty, and people want to come bring their children to our schools. So, but um, but if I am also comfortable with just you know the the bat if that's not the case for tonight, I am comfortable with the bathrooms that Dr. Trujillo had suggested in Foreman. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Trujillo and then Ms. Shaw. Yeah, and I don't, we, we don't want this to be doomy and gloomy. I, it, it's kind of what Dr. Shaw said. We're gonna say the same thing. This is not a no to everything else. This is like, hey, we're gonna do this stuff now. We're gonna take a look at what comes out of the budget. Uh, I think Renee mentioned an important point. The state is yet to finalize the budget. We're gonna see where we stand at the 40th day. Um, that's gonna be huge for us. We gotta see if Tuva takes off again, if that's gonna be a, a sustainable revenue source for us. So it's, it, we, as I mentioned a few weeks ago when we were talking about the wage issue, this board can amend its budget at any time. You can do a budget revision. We have our first mandatory one in November. So even though it kind of feels like we have to do everything now, we'd love to see everything done now, it's not necessarily the end of these projects if we delay a little bit and we see where we stand when enrollment comes in. Thank you. Uh, Misha. Thank you. Um, you know, I would really like us to not delay the football field at Pueblo because it is a safety concern. Like there have been cases, you know, at other schools and other districts and other states where football players injure themselves and they're paralyzed for life. And I don't want that to happen to our uh, students. Um, I saw the aerial photo of the football field at Pueblo and it it's just a mess. And like, I don't think it could be really put off for asking those students to, you know, play on them and other, and other students as well to, to play and practice. Um, on that football field. And I really think that we should put off the parking lot because this is Tucson. We all know the state of our roads and like a, a holy parking lot, like that's kind of the conditions of our city. And so uh, repavement of a parking lot is not student focused. You know, yeah, you might kind of mess up a tire, but you're not gonna break your leg or, you know, ruin your uh, football career for life because you had an injury from, uh, you know, a field that had patchy grass. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Um, so, and again, going back to the Aminal carrier for we don't have $28 million. We've already, we've already uh, committed some of that money with some of the things we've approved over the last few months. So we actually don't have $28 million of carry forward next year because we've already, we've already committed some of that with salaries and, and, and things that we've approved. And so what, I, what I'd like us to do tonight is approve the Vorman amount. I want to get a clear number are we approving 3.3 .3 million? Are we approving 5 point something million tonight on Borman? Approve the 5.3 million dollars in bathroom renovations. I'd like the rest of this to come back uh, in April, Dr. Trujillo, um, after we've approved the salaries and know how much carry forward we actually do have left over. Uh, and I don't think we need to wait until the 40th day next year. I think we can approve some more of this this mm -hmm. year for the next fiscal year. But I don't think I'll have it tonight. But I'd like this to come back in April sometime. Uh, after the salary negotiations are completed and approved um, so we can we can make some more decisions on things that we can get started right away like pavements and, and fine arts and, and fields and other things which we, again, my, my, my point is that these don't need to happen. Of course they need to happen but we need to make sure we do that in, in, in a yeah. proper way. Yeah, and I, um, I appreciate Ms. Shaw's comment about Pueblo High School football field but Choya's is pretty bad too. Yeah, it's hard because we have all these needs that are pretty significant. Um, okay, I think we have a majority for the Tucson High, Pueblo, Rincon, and Choya restrooms, which is 5.3 million, is that correct? Yes. 5.4, okay. 5.3. 5.3, and then we have Borman, which is 5.3. 5.3. Okay, and then, um, and what does that leave us as far as carry forward if we're at 10.6 or 7? Um, that would leave five. you at about 
to the good on this slide here. Five million mm -hmm. in capital. And so then minimally, Dr. Trujillo, we would come back in April with that list. Right, so, so as it stands, you know, and, and I think Renee made an important point. Dr. Shaw asked, hey, how much of that? She penciled in $18 million, making an assumption that we're gonna spend that exact same amount, but there might be two or three million inside of that 18 that doesn't repeat as an expenditure that might be added on, right? Renee to the five mil? Um, I, I factored in some of that, but okay. one of the other points I will make is the procurement deadline is also in April. So we'll get really close to an end of spend by that right. point. So, okay. So what is that? So should we, should we like? We hmm. can proceed with the 10.6 that was discussed right now. Okay. So that, if I could just, what we really want for just real clarity and brevity here mm -hmm. is this $10.5 million spending package. Out the door, okay, what are they staring at for an ending balance June 30th, 2023, after they've carried over funds from fiscal year 22 into 23, and then after they've, uh, they've encumbered the expenditures of our projected fresh 19 million coming at us in 23, You've penciled in FY spending level at 8.4, making an assumption that we're gonna run through the same $18.4 million in fiscal year 23 that we ran through uh, in fiscal year 22. So how much are we gonna have out the door, right? Okay. And so we've heard the number 5 million. So my question is, is that 5 million exclusive of, is that, is that 5 million based off of the assumption that we're gonna run through all 18.4 million of those dollars, there's no room, or inside of that 18.4, are we saying there's two or three million dollars that they're not necessarily recurring expenses and we can tag it on to your projected five million? That's what we... So let me clarify, spending for fiscal 23, 15 million, we're backing out one-time expenditures. Okay. We have seven that's already been approved by the board this year that needs to carry forward. That's 22. Okay. We're approving 10 tonight. That gets you to 32. Okay. So we would end up with about $5 million carry forward at the end of 23. Five million, final number. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I, um, I would really like to see us include the football fields and the, the arts and I understand the concern, um, the pavement repair. So that would get us another, that would leave us closer to two million if we were to include those. So I don't know where the board is on that possibility. Or like a, we'd be like at one point. 3.2. So we'd still be in the black, just not as much. And I think that that would alleviate what we've heard from everyone as priorities. And all of these are priorities, I understand. Security is a big deal too. But if we could approve those top four bathroom, the, the schools that I mentioned already, the pavement repair and maintenance, the fine arts, and the fields in interscholastics. That would leave us with, right, about two million? Or no? I hate doing this on the diet, by the way. President Grohapa. Yes. I don't normally do this, but I'm, I'm going to have to say I'm really embarrassed right now. I don't think we're ready for a vote tonight. You're making up some numbers, Renee, on the spot, it seems like. We don't really know what, what's going on with this. Like, I am, I am just really frustrated. Like, I, I am embarrassed. Like, this is, like, if anybody's watching this meeting, I'm embarrassed. Because we are just, we're not prepared for a vote tonight. With all this, you know, we're going to add more things. Like, let's prove everything and just, you know, have a big deficit. And I, I don't know what we're voting on. I don't know what the numbers are. Yeah. Like, do not come to us. Do not come to the governing board meeting without being prepared with the right numbers. 
Don't show us slides that you know are wrong, Renee. You say like, oh, there's other things in here, there's not, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't put us in a position to make multi-million dollar votes without having the information we need to do this properly. Do not do this again. I think, um, I appreciate your frustration and I understand it and I think that staff is frustrated too because we need, all of these are really great needs and I, I don't wanna walk away without voting. So. Come back to us in two weeks with the right information so we can make an educated decision and know exactly what we're voting on and what we have. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable yeah. request. Um, you know, we could have been more specific. I think what, what uh, to me, when I take a look at what tonight, uh, what the critical juncture was, was not accounting for those encumbrances. Um, and the information that was presented uh, looks a lot like an approval of this package would have resulted in about $1.5 million that would have been needed to carry over from M&O, which seemed to be straightforward, but without including those uh, encumbrances of projects from this fiscal year that would need to be funded to the next, change the entire, entire complexion of the conversation. So we do need to do further analysis and study, come back here in a few weeks uh, to be able to present the accurate information. Okay, so we'll have this on for next time. Thank you. We have a motion on the table. Yeah, so I'll a have motion. to withdraw my motion and we'll just move the item to our upcoming board meeting. Yes, Ms. Shaw. Thank you. Um, you know, I understand your frustration too, Dr. Ravi, but I think some of the stuff we can vote on, we've heard some of the stuff from Ms. Weatherless and I don't wanna just keep waiting when you know we we've been sort of presented with most of the information and i i just want to make sure that we're not going to put the grant at borman at risk if we do not vote on that tonight mr vice Dix. so i think the uh two week wait um you know we've been waiting now for 31 months um, we are waiting for comments back from the dod uh, i think two weeks would be sufficient enough time for us to uh, wait. I don't anticipate the grant uh, going away. Uh, we've been working with them, uh, with the Department of Defense really on a weekly basis. So I think as long as we maintain that consistent communication, the grant will still be there uh, in, with, within those two weeks. I think the communication with the DOD is gonna be uh, Paramount, and I'll give them a call first thing in the morning. Well, I don't, I don't want to put that in jeopardy. Um, Ms. Shaw, do you have a motion? Or do, would you like me to make one? Uh, I would like to move forward with the motion that we already had on so That's the Borman table. and the four high school bathrooms? Uh, correct. Well, so, so um, point of order, the, the current motion on the table is to approve the entire package, and since it's been seconded, it, it's not longer your motion to I, be able to withdraw. I withdrew. You can't do that, though, because it's, it's, once it's seconded, it's no longer your motion. It's the board's motion. Okay, so, so let's go ahead and do this. We can make a substitute motion yes. that I am going, that we're going to move forward with Borman and the four high schools, restrooms, Tucson High, Pueblo, Rincon, and Choya. Would you agree to that friendly amendment? Well, I'll second Ms. that. Luna Rose. You can, again, you second. can't do that friendly because it doesn't work that way. You need to have a, a okay, substitute. Okay, so go ahead and make the friendly amendment, well, I'll, I'll Dr. Robbie. I'll second your substitute. Okay, motion. that's fine. So I have a motion in a second. Yep. All right, is everyone clear about what it is? It's Borman and the four high schools. Yeah? Okay. And that will bring this item back. So can I get um, all those? It's Borman, four high schools. Uh, Ms. Luna Rose, do you have a question? Uh, no. Sorry. No, okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item passes. And now we need to vote on the main motion. I'm sorry? Now we need to vote on the main motion. We have a substitute that was approved, and so we need to have a main a vote on the main motion, which is No, the substitute two was approved, so that nullifies the, the main motion. No, it just substitutes the main motion with the new motion, and now we okay, have a Okay, so the, the main motion was the entire package. But that's so been substituted I would, now. I'm sorry? So that's been substituted now, so the vote we'll have is to approve the motion, which is now the substituted motion. Understood. Okay. So... For the, same, for the motion that we have approved, just approved the substitute motion, it is the um, Borman and the four 
high school restrooms. And I have a motion and a second. Do you have that, Yolanda? Yeah? Okay. Yes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Item passes unanimously. That was a lot of work for her. Which should be a really positive thing. Okay. Thank you, staff, for the presentation. Now we're on banking services. Um, item number 9.3. Policy DG Banking Services. This is a first read, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, uh, I'd like to turn this item over to uh, our general counsel, Mr. Ross. We've got a series of policies tonight, first reads, uh, largely brought on by changes in statute. Mr. Ross. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo and members of the board. All of these are brought on by statutory changes or compliance with statute. So the first one, 9.3, is a new policy, would be a new policy, uh, first reading on banking services in it really is consolidates several statutory provisions as to how um, how the district will deal with uh, these different kinds of funds, impact aid, auxiliary, revol and revolving funds. Uh, we do most of this in practice to the extent that we uh, that we uh, use these funds, but this would codify it into into policy. Um, again, this is a first read, so this would go out for comment to the community. Okay, board members, any comments? Do I have a motion? I'll move. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Um, can we go ahead and take a quick five minute break? As long as there's no objection. Okay, thank you.
anything, this allows if another school district asks for records, then we can contact the law enforcement and say, hey, a school district in X place requested these records so they can follow up and find the missing folks. So this is a statute and we're putting it into policy so that we can, uh, we can make sure those records get flagged. Okay, I'll go ahead and move the item. I'll second. So I move the item and um, Clerk Luna Rose seconds. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item passes unanimously. Item 9.4, Governing Board Policy JLD Guidance and Counseling. Mr. Yeah. Ross. Yes, uh, thank you, President Grijalva. Again, this is uh, a revision based on a statutory change uh, from last year and it requires parental consent for any mental health screening. This is something that we already do in practice, but um, we want to make sure that we put it into policy because there, the statute does have criminal liability if there's a violation, and we want to make sure that our, our counselors, social workers, and psychologists are, um, have an extra layer of knowledge that uh, this is something that cannot be done. So again, this is the first reading. It would go out for comment uh, if approved. Okay. Board members? I'll go ahead and move the item. I'll second. I have a motion and a second by Ms. Luna Rose, and this just puts it out for the public. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item passes unanimously. Now we're on item governing board policy, or 9.6 governing board policy, JLCD administering medicines and treatments to students. Uh, Mr. Ross. Uh, yes, I'll turn this over to Mr. Aronoff, Associate General Counsel. He's been working on this one with uh, staff. Okay. Good evening again. Mr. Aronoff. Um, so this, this change is also statutory. Uh, there is a law that requires us to have a policy regarding the emergency administration of naloxone hydrochloride, commonly known as Narcan, um, or other opiate antagonists. Uh, in the event of an opioid overdose. Um, this statute and the policy implements a separate state statute which provides broad protection for anyone, including explicitly school employees, to administer uh, Narcan uh, or similar drugs in the case of, a, of an opioid overdose. There, you will also note um, we added in the, the epinephrine and um, and inhalers, the 15, 157, and 158. Those were previously covered and remain covered in the regulation, um, but should also be included in the policy. All of these are exceptions to situations when um, we would not require parental consent before administering drugs in an emergency situation. Uh, so they're all for safety reasons. Uh, oh. And this also is a first read and we'll be going to the public for comment. Okay, and is the reason why we don't list Narcan is because that's a brand? Correct, oh, the, okay. the, exactly. The, the statute is, is naloxone, it specifies naloxone hydrochloride or other op opioid antagonists. Okay, thank you. I'll go ahead and move the item. I'll second. I have a motion and a second by um, Clerk Luna Rose. Any, yes, Ms. Shaw. Thank you. Uh, just a question. Um, so uh, will the naloxone be available at every school site? So my understanding of things as they currently stand is that naloxone is available at high schools, um, and that is through the efforts uh, of, I think, primarily Nikki uh, Stefan, and um, as I understand it, school safety also has access uh, and has some training on that. Um, but. So broadly speaking, the, the prescription for naloxone, which is it's given by Arizona Department of Health Services, there's a standing order for naloxone, which can be administered to anybody over the age of five or over 20 kilograms. So it's a very broad, um, it's very broad access. Practically speaking, at the moment, I believe it's, it's only available in high schools. Um, I think they're, they're certainly is the potential for expanding that um, for the sake of, you know, it's, I, I think the question actually came up today at a middle school. Um, so we want to, we do want to make sure that we have it available as, as broadly as we can to make sure they're being safe. And it's not, frankly, it's not just for students. Um, you know, we want to be able to administer it to anybody who happens to be on campus who needs that uh, in a crisis. 
Absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I know this isn't like really up on the policy, but I hope that we can um, have doses at every school site um, just because, you know, that's the world we live in now. Um, and not just like one dose, but like at least five because, you know, sometimes when students or people are experimenting, like, you know, other people are using with them. And so we need more than uh, one dose available. Yeah, I think that the health department and the sheriff's department were giving them away for free. And so there isn't anything that we would have to change in policy in order to make sure that all of our campuses have them. Is there? Okay. So maybe we can work with the health department just, just so we have that. Because I think that makes a lot of sense, especially in some of our um, K-8s and middle schools. But every campus, especially if we're saying for anyone that's available, we don't know if there would be a parent or staff, you know, yeah. It's, and certainly if, if I could. I, yes, absolutely. I, the, I, I think implementing the policy um, certainly opens the door to make sure that we're, we're able to uh, put very clear procedures in place on our end so that we are making sure it's available wider maybe than it currently is even. Okay, all right. Okay, so any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item passes unanimously. Now we're on 10.1 to USD Student Academic Performance Progress Report and Assessment Readiness. Dr. Trujillo. Yeah, Board President Grijalva, members of the board, we have some great news to share as we start talking about this first year back uh, for students uh, after what's been a very, very difficult last 18 months. We're going to talk about all the different interventions and programs that we have going on in our schools to combat interrupted learning as a result of this pandemic. We'll talk about some of the digital platforms, some of the success we've seen, and some of the bright spots from some of the internal assessment work that we've done that could indicate uh, a very, very strong recovery this coming spring. Mrs. Hewitt. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Good evening, governing board members, President Grijalva, Dr. Trujillo, and legal counsel. This evening we'll be discussing our Student Achievement Progress Report, as Dr. Trujillo stated, as well as very specific interventions and teaching and learning systems that we have in the district. Next slide, please. For tonight's topics, we'll discuss two broad topics. We'll touch on our Student Achievement Progress Report, and then we'll transition to discuss what systems we have in place to combat interrupted learning due to the COVID pandemic. To kick us off, I will ha be handing us off to Dr. Freitas, who is our Senior Director for Assessment and Evaluation, who will discuss our progress reports. Next slide, please. Dr. Freitas. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. This, um, this set of data is a uh, pre-post that we administered to all students in grades three through 11. And before I talk about the results, I wanna just walk you through how to read this because it's a lot of bar graphs. So let's start at the very left-hand side. And you'll see that there's a pink bar graph and that is third grade pretest. And then the green bar next to it is the post-test. And so it's third grade, fourth grade on until 11th grade, and then you'll see in the middle of the graph, there's a dotted line. And after that, it starts math. So math, the pink, um, I think it says, I can't see it, 17% maybe. Um, so that is third grade pretest, and then the green bar is third grade post-test. So that's, that's how you look at the data. And so this pre-post, testing was administered as part of the teacher evaluation growth points. And um, we were really excited to share this data with you today. Uh, it's just raw data, it's percent correct. So we haven't you know, done all the stats on it for the teacher evaluation. But what, um, what's important about this data is that in 2021, our AZM2, our AZ Merit data showed that our greatest losses occurred in elementary school, in grades three through five in both ELA and math. And what this data is showing us is that on the pre-post test, that's exactly where we're seeing the greatest gains. And so we're really excited that the, um, 
that the students are rebounding, that they're regaining some of the learning loss from last year. The other positive note is if you look at ELA in general, which is the left-hand side of the pink and green bar graphs, you'll see that there's pretty good growth across the board. Elementary shows the greatest, but um, I also want to acknowledge the other grades as well, middle school and high school. And then if we look at the more on the right side, you'll see in math, the greatest growth again is in grades three through six, which is uh, really important for our students because that's where we saw so much loss on the state test last year. And then in grades seven through 11, we see some growth, but it's more um, tame, so to speak. And that's most likely because these are more complex math concepts, and it may take longer for um, students to recover those, um, you know, that sort of math conceptual process um, before they reach grade level proficiency. So overall, I'm pretty excited about this data. Um, this is about 16 or 17 weeks of instruction um, because we administered the pre in August and the post in the end of January, early February. And so we still have about six weeks left from, from the time that we collected this data to state testing. So um, we're I'm sure there's going to be more growth before the students start to take our state tests. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Hewitt. Thank you, Dr. Freitas. Next slide, please. All right, uh, we know that COVID has caused a tremendous amount of interrupted learning for our students across the nation. Specifically for our district though, we have systems in place to combat the interrupted learning our students have experienced. In the next part of the presentation, we wanna to present to the board and to the public what systems the district has in place to ensure that our students continue to thrive post COVID. The next part of the presentation is organized into the sections that you see on the slide, but we will hone in on discussing specifically our tiered instruction system, our interventions, our targeted learning sessions, and highlight some of the data from our digital platforms. Next slide, please. All right, uh, we know that strong student learning begins with strong instruction in the classroom, day in and day out. Teachers provide different tiers or levels of instruction as you see in the graphic above. Uh, allow me to explain each of, each of the tiers before we delve into what our district does specifically for each one of these tiers. So the very bottom tier, tier one instruction, is what we often refer to as first time instruction. It is instruction that's provided to all students. Highly effective tier one instruction is planned out in advance to provide access and is differentiated to meet the needs of all learners and all students. Then we move on to tier two. Tier two instruction is in addition to tier one instruction and it's provided to students who need additional support. And there are assessments that happen during tier one that help identify the students that are, that are in need of additional support or instruction. And tier two is provided in a timely manner as a result of formative assessments that happen during the day in the classroom. Uh, the last tier, and hopefully you can see it's tier three instruction, and this is in addition to tier one. For students who need intensive and frequent support, tier three instruction is provided typically individually or in very small groups, and it's intensified and more individualized to meet the needs of a few students. Next slide, please. So, Specific to our district, TUSD uses what's called the multi-tiered system of support to identify students in need of academic or social emotional interventions and to track intervention plans. So what happens at each school site in TUSD, we have an MTSS team and either a full-time MTSS facilitator or an MTSS lead overseeing the MTSS process at each school site. So students in need of support, they're identified and observations are entered into our synergy system, MTSS system, and, request, and a request for support can be submitted through the system for students that uh, have three or more observations. So we gather student data, discuss that at MTSS meeting, and then a tier two intervention plan is created. And it's monitored and adjusted as needed. Now, if students are not responding to tier two interventions, then 
those efforts will progress to a tier three support. Now with that, uh, we're gonna delve into what platform specifically we have in our district to address each of those tiers. And I will hand it off to my colleague, uh, Senior Director Heidi Aranda. Good evening. So next slide. So in accordance with state and federal law, we are required to identify and select instructional programs that have been rigorously studied and have shown improved student learning. These studies are submitted to a national clearinghouse and if approved, are assigned a level of strong or moderate evidence. The following slides will demonstrate the programs approved in TUSD for all three tiers of instruction and intervention. Next slide. We know that strong student learning begins with strong instruction. Tier one instruction begins with our district curriculum that identifies what state standards are identified and emphasized each quarter and the aligned curriculum resources that teachers use to plan effective instruction. TUSD uses the Danielson framework, universal design for learning, and our own SPARKS uh, culturally responsive teaching framework to plan accessible and differentiated instruction. Schools use the structure of professional learning communities and collaborative teacher teams to identify common formative assessments and analyze the results to identify students' needs for intervention. Structures like walk to math or reading, small group instruction, and guided reading allow teachers to differentiate instruction according to students' needs. Next slide. Here you find the identified platforms and programs teachers use for tier one instruction. And in this slide, you'll find our core adopted materials, as well as some of the supplemental materials that teachers use to reinforce tier one instruction. Next slide. Tier two instruction is often provided by grade level teachers, identified intervention teachers, or district support. It is also provided using programs such as targeted learning sessions and 21st century. It can also be facilitated through community partnerships such as Literacy Connects or the Pima uh, Public Library. Next slide. These are the approved platforms and programs for Tier 2 instruction um, in Tucson Unified. Again, you'll find some core and supplemental programs. Next slide. Tier 3 instruction is frequent, highly structured um, instruction that is usually provided by a highly qualified teacher or specialist. Tier 3 instruction is in addition to Tier 1 instruction for students who need intensive and frequent support. Next slide. And here are um, the Tier 3 programs and platforms approved in TUSD, and, and you'll see that our focus in Tier 3 is um, interventions in ELA and math. Now we're gonna take a look at one of our um, interventions, our Tier 2 interventions in Tucson Unified. Um, they're called Targeted Learning Sessions. Targeted Learning Sessions is a um, program that Dr. Trujillo actually initiated when he was Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction to provide CUSP students or students who are on the cusp of advancing to the next proficiency level with a targeted intervention for nine weeks in the third quarter. Our assessment and evaluation department provide sites with a list of potential students to invite to these sessions based on various data points. The curriculum team prepares a targeted curriculum and trains all teachers. This year, almost 2,000 students are enrolled in targeted learning sessions. The number of students in high school is low because high schools use response to intervention and credit recovery courses in place of targeted learning sessions for the most part. This is because semester, not quarter courses in high school are a better fit for scheduling and graduation purposes, credit purposes. Next slide. 
Each year our students that attend targeted learning sessions outperform their peers that do not attend. As you can see, students in elementary, um, and these are, are in math, students in elementary made a 3.37 increase in proficiency in math, um, while students that did not attend TLS actually decreased in proficiency by 2%. In K-8, although students in TLS sessions decreased by 1.81% in proficiency, students that did not attend decreased almost 7% in proficiency. The largest gains were in middle school, where targeted learning session students gained 3.58% uh, in proficiency, while students not attending TLS decreased 7.11%, um, which is almost an 11% 11 11 difference in achievement. Next slide. Similar gains are noted in ELA, although I won't go over those numbers specifically. Next slide. Schools have access to high quality digital platforms to address student needs in tiers one, two, and three, as identified on previous slides. I would like to walk you through two schools data on two different platforms and how this data is used to inform instruction in all tiers. Both of these platforms, <clears throat> as many others, use adaptive assessment and instruction. Most assessments that students encounter during the school year are known as fixed length assessments. Every student who takes the assessment sees the same set of questions. <clears throat> adaptive assessments, on the other hand, are nearly always computer delivered and adjust to students as they take them a series of correct answers will resu result in slightly high, harder questions, a series, uh, while a series of incorrect answers will yield slightly easier questions. By adapting to students' responses and assessing a broad range of skills, adaptive assessments pinpoint student proficiency levels, identify specific skills students need to learn in order to accelerate their growth, and chart a personalized learning path for each student. Next slide. The first digital platform we will look at is IXL. We started using IXL about seven years ago as part of our instructional model for targeted learning sessions. Each year the program has grown in implementation and now all Tucson Unified students have math and ELA licenses. At all all schools are using IXL to support both daily instruction and uh, intervention. This year, our Project Elevate schools have used IXL as a source of rich formative and summative assessment data. To date, our Project Elevate schools have completed six diagnostic assessments in IXL, which have provided them with ongoing real-time data on each student's progress. A benefit to using IXL for this assessment is that it doesn't it is that students don't feel like they are taking a test since the diagnostic is stylistically similar to how regular practice in the platform occurs. So let's look at some of the data that is provided on both the school level and the student level. The table on the left is a progress and growth report for third through eighth grade. This table includes year-to-date practice data along with the most recent diagnostic assessment results aggregated by grade level and subject. Let's look at the top row, the third grade data, in more detail. The second to the last column on the right shows the current average diagnostic score of 269 for math and 262 for ELA. These scores are interpreted as a grade level followed by percent through the content, meaning that a score of 262 denotes that students are 62% of the way through second grade content. Since we are looking at third grade, the score is below grade level. On grade level for third grade would be a score <laughs> in the 300s. However, the last column <clears throat> showing the average monthly growth is telling a very positive story. 
we see that the average monthly growth for third grade is 16 points for math and 23 points for ELA. Since 100 points represents a year's worth of growth, we would expect students to average 10 to 11 points per month to be on track for one academic year of growth. Therefore, 16 points is about one and a half times the expected yearly growth rate and 23 points is over two times the expected yearly growth rate. If you scan the last column, you can see that most grade levels at this school are averaging 10 points or better. Therefore, on track to make one year, one academic year's worth of growth. The amazing part is that third, fourth, and fifth grade, in third, fourth, and fifth grade, these students are making double or almost double growth each month. This means that students are gaining more than a year's growth. For a student that is behind, that means they are catching up. For a student already at grade level, that means that they are, they are getting ahead or accelerating their learning. To look at this a little more specifically, let's look at the table on the top right. This is data from the 10 students at this school with the highest levels of growth in ELA. If you look at the last column, diagnostic growth, you can see that a student number one grew 360 points. This means they have already demonstrated more than 3.6 years worth of growth. When they started the school year as a fourth grader, they scored 340, meaning 40% 40 of the way through third grade level. Currently, they are at 700, which is the beginning of seventh grade. Students highlighted in blue in this table are currently performing now above grade level. And students highlighted in green started the school year behind, but have caught up and are currently on grade level. This school level data is very important for principals and teachers to assess the effectiveness of instruction. Furthermore, after each diagnostic assessment is completed, IXL provides a diagnostic assessment plan, action plan for each student. An example of this is included in the lower right portion of the screen. This helps both teachers and students to know exactly which skills the students need to work on next. The focus on growth allows students that are behind to see that all they, though they are still not at grade level, they are progressing at a good rate. It also lets them know specifically what skills to work on. This kind of information supports the development of a growth mindset. This information is also helpful for planning both whole group and small group instruction and is pivotal for interventionists and support staff. Next slide. iReady is a newer platform to us. We started using iReady during the pandemic for summer school and have continued using it with our middle schools. iReady also administers a diagnostic multiple times through the school year and describes annual typical growth. The data is from one of our middle schools. Let's start on the left. Currently at the school, the median progress towards one year growth is 108%. That means that half of the students have already grown higher than 108% or more than one year. On the top right are the students' current placement. We can donate it. We can see that 17% of the school students are currently on or above grade level. 18% are one grade level below. Nine are two grade levels below, and 56 are three or more grade levels below. The important piece of this data is shown in the percentages written in green and red below the current distribution bar graph. Although the amount of students not at grade level is concerning and an indication of the last two years of interrupted learning, these positive percentages are showing growth in all categories. For example, the amount of students three or more grade levels below has been reduced by 9% from 65% at the beginning of the year to 56% at the school year midpoint. In addition, students on or above grade level increased by 10% from 7 to 17%. This trend of moving students to higher proficiency levels 
is what we want to see and we expect these percentages to get better as the school year progresses. In the bottom of the slide, we can see percentages of students achieving typical growth. Currently, 53% of students at this school have achieved one year's growth or typical growth. At the time this assessment was taken, typically we expect to see about 20% of students. So achieving 53% is excellent. In addition, this school's data is showing that 90% of their students have already shown stretch growth, which means um, more than one year's growth and a trajectory towards um, a path towards grade level proficiency. Next slide. Platform data is used by schools in many ways to diagnose, measure progress and growth, group students, personalize learning, and motivate students to meet attainable short-term goals. Most importantly, digital platforms are a tool for the teacher. It is the teacher's use of the platform in their classroom to reinforce the instruction and the strategic use of the data provided that truly impacts the effectiveness of a digital platform. Tonight, we only share data from two platforms. However, we do receive monthly data reports from all platforms. These reports are organized by region and uploaded onto our ILA SharePoint so that district and school administrators can review the data and progress of all schools monthly. In addition to the monthly reports, these platforms have a wealth of classroom level and student level data available to teachers. As a district, we do also conduct our own effectiveness reports. For example, at the end of the school year, we have planned to conduct two analyses. The first is to conduct the effect analysis of the effectiveness of our early reading intervention programs. The second is to conduct an analysis of the IXL student data as a pre predictor of student proficiency on our state exam. This type of analysis can improve our use of the platform and the data re we receive for the platform, as well as indicate to us um, whether we want to continue using that particular platform. As we increase use of these digital tools, we improve our strategic implementation and evaluation of the results. At this time, I'd like to turn it over for questions. Okay, board members, questions? Dr. Ravi. Uh, thank you, President Grava, and thank you for this presentation. Um, I have a lot of questions. I wanted to actually just make sure I understand slide 18 correctly, the, the, the IXL, and thank you for um, the explanation, Ms. Rhonda, of uh, what, what some of those, the data points mean here. So uh, from what I understand, the second to last column in the main table is the grade level. And if I'm reading this correctly, are, are we plateauing at fourth grade? Like, uh, at this school, like, what's, because I see the, this fifth grade, and then I see all the way to eighth grade, there's no improvement grade to grade in terms of reading and math um, levels on here. So on the, on the right, the last column, you will see the growth. So you're right. seeing positive growth in all of the grade levels. What we're seeing is, is, is there is a little struggle here in sixth grade in achieving that one year's growth, um, but all of the other grade levels are achieving that one year's growth. Um, no, I appreciate it. I'm looking at the second to, to last column there. And so are we saying that the eighth graders are reading at the fourth grade level and a math at the fourth grade level? So why, why do you think we're plateauing at fourth grade? Because it looks like, looks like, you know, at fifth grade, they're about a year behind, but they're not making any progress after that. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they're still pretty much scoring the same numbers, if not less numbers, in a fifth grade. So what, what's going on? I think that you're seeing um, really a story of a school that has implemented some some really effective um, strategies for instruction. And you're seeing that growth in the younger grades, whereas the, the um, middle school grades, it's harder to make the levels of growth in middle school that you can at elementary. And we saw that in our pre and post data, right? That with our younger students advancing grade levels when they're behind, which is why we try to catch them young, because it's harder to 
to make up that ground in, in the upper grades. And you do see some bright spots. You see um, grade seven um, making up some of that ground. But yes, they are entering at a much lower level than, than their third or fifth graders entered the school year. Do you have other questions, Dr. Ravi? So what is it about like, like the 500 levels that we can't get our students to? Like what is, about, is there something about fifth grade English and math and, and, and beyond that we're really struggling to get our students caught up to? Because like they're falling behind from like being a few months behind in fourth grade to being years behind by eighth grade. And so we're not, like this school, the data mm -hmm. here from when I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, like we're not doing any catch up. Like they're, they're, they're not making any progress from, from, from fifth grade to, to eighth grade. Um, I think that they are making progress. You're looking at different groups of students. So we'd have to dig a little deeper into the data and look at that group of sixth graders, look at them as fifth graders to see, to, to sort of make that claim, right? We'd have to see where did they, where did they end the year at fifth grade? What was their progress? Um, it could be a class that really was struggling um, so academically. So they further behind maybe is what you're trying to say. Right. Potentially is what... Mm -hmm. You'd have to look at where they started. And we're if you look at that chart of the top 10 kids, you'll see some students there, some eighth graders, that started at a very, very low level um, at the beginning of the school year and have made multiple years of growth, but still aren't quite at grade level. Ms. Shaw. Thank you. Um, I'm also concerned about these numbers that we're seeing on this slide. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that, like, you know, if these uh, subscriptions or platforms were effective, then these numbers wouldn't be so low. Eighth graders at a fourth grade level. And they've had IXL for a couple years now. And it's just, it's, we can't, these are not numbers that we should be celebrating. Those minute, um, monthly growth numbers plus nine, that's, that's not good enough. And I feel like we're putting all of our eggs in this, uh, you know, digital platform basket and it's just not making the substan substantive growth that we need our students to make. And I'm really kind of surprised that like the tier two uh, interventions, it's, you know, mostly with the subscriptions and the digital stuff and not really one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is what I think could really uh, move the lever and get some of these students where they need to go. And then looking down at the next slide um, at the TUSD middle school story, it's 83% of students are uh, a year or more below grade level three uh, fifty six percent are three or more, and so we need radical help in our schools and putting a kid in front of a computer it's that 's not going to help them, especially if they 're three grade levels behind that 's just like putting them in front of a computer and thinking that that 's going to solve the problem you know it 's very easy to kind of um, just expect these numbers to go up and, you know, throwing millions of dollars away on these things and technology when we should be investing in books and people who can help uh, give one-on-one -on -one help to our students. And really, like, for the growth that does happen, I'm not convinced that outside of the program it's going to uh, translate when it comes to uh, reading and writing and research skills. And please remember that our digital platforms are a tool for the teacher. It, it's not, um, even in targeted learning sessions where we do use IXL as part of our instructional model, it is one third of um, that student's interaction. What we do is exactly what you, what you said, is we build a model that allows teachers to work one-on-one -on -one with students or in small groups with students because we know that the most effective um, at increasing student achievement is having that teacher in front. But the teacher uses 
um, data and the tool of a digital platform to reinforce. So a lot of kids need multiple opportunities to say, see the same concept, right? They might not get it originally from a lesson that the teacher teaches. But if then the teacher assigns an assignment on a digital platform where the student gets to practice that same concept in a different modality, in a different way, it, it really deepens their learning. And for some of them, for some students, it may, they make additional connections. So it really, you're right, a digital platform is not going to solve a student achievement um, issue. It is a, a tool and um, it provides valuable information to site leaders, to um, district leaders, to teachers, to students and parents. Thank you. Dr. Ravi. Yeah. And, and, and thank you, Ms. Shaw, for, for kind of adding on to that. Like I'm I'm just I, I see I see the in the previous slide again, I'm still I'm still can't get off this AXL slide with the eighth graders doing 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 it seems like worse in math than our fifth graders and are growing less slowly the nine percent or nine nine points versus twenty one points. Like what like what is going on? There's no that's not more issues of poverty because I imagine the, the cohorts are probably the same like socioeconomically. So it's not issues of poverty or race or, or, or zip code because it's the same middle school that we're talking about. So what is going on in the eighth grade that they're reading that or and, and math at the same level as the fifth graders and are growing slower? Is it is it mental health and behavioral health issues? Like what is I'd love to see us dig deeper into why the eighth graders are not gaining in the same way the fifth graders are, even though they're kind of at the same level of reading and math. And what do we need to do? Is it really academic interventions or is it mental health interventions? Is it, is it something else that's going to make that impact? Because now they went from a few months behind in fifth grade to four years behind in eighth grade, and they're not catching up as quickly. And so we need to, I, I would really ask us to dig deeper in terms of what is going on, why is that the case, and what do we do as a district you know, for the thousands of eighth graders that we have that are, that are, that are behind the fifth graders. Mm -hmm. And how did interrupted learning affect students when they're learning those pre-algebra concepts, right? Because the, the mathematical middle school concepts that they learn in middle school are, are pretty advanced and lay the foundation, right, for, for high school um, advanced mathematics. So I, I think it's a lot, it's a complex question and, and I agree with you. It, it merits some digging deeper. Dr. Trujillo. Middle school math has been Mount Everest every year that I've been here. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is indicative of that. It's been exacerbated with the, uh, the pandemic. Even if you look at our AZ merit pre-COVID, middle school math was that grade band, sixth, seventh, and eighth, was always the struggle in all of our tested grade levels and even on the ELA side. It is also the grade band where we experience a great bulk of our teacher shortage. It's really difficult to get highly qualified um, math and ELA content specialists in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade because most of them do opt for the high schools. And that's when you have those 30 university hours of subject matter. Well, they're basically now working in our high schools, right, as, as certified high school teachers. So middle school continues to be the challenge. Uh, and I hearken back to a few years ago before COVID hit, in our attempts to look at middle school and reimagine it in a whole different way, we talked about the K-8. Because what we do know is those middle school students that are embedded up inside of a K-8 tend to do better in a whole bunch of different markers, attendance, behavior, uh, academically, they do a little bit better in math and English and language arts versus those that are in the standalone giant middle schools, those sixth, seventh, and eighths. And we thought, hey, what if we went K-6 and we started to do seven, eight specific middle schools with smaller class sizes, built-in socio-emotional learning, one period a day for every kid, mandatory um, for every kid. You don't have to get in trouble to get access to SEL. It's part of your day. Every kid with an option for arts or sports. We had to put that aside because of COVID. But I think what we're looking at is larger scale structural reform on how we do middle schools. Um, and, and you're seeing a symptom of it here, but when you look at middle schools as a whole, where are we most challenged with enrollment? Well, it's fifth grade families coming into sixth grade. Where's our most pronounced teacher shortages? It's this grade band, six, seven, eight. Where are the struggles with ELA and math, six, seven, eight? And it really begs the question of 
let's, let's try to reimagine how we're gonna do middle school. Because the current structure, it's not working. We're doing interventions, we'll continue to do interventions. I think IXL because we see growth and growth is good. Growth is, it's what we've said about standardized testing. It's not all about proficiency, it's how far you grow kids. It's the skill levels that you build upon and our kids are showing growth, but we're not done. Uh, as uh, some of our board members have said this evening. So I think it's a, it's a larger structural, to take a look at how we're gonna do middle schools type issue um, versus just what's going on with a particular group of kids. I agree. Mm -hmm. I do think it's, um, it's an age where there's a lot of changes going on with young people. And um, I remember when we moved to elementary being K-5 and we moved the sixth grade, it wasn't for any sort of academic reason. It was because we didn't have room <laughs> in our elementary schools and needed that space. And so we thought, well, we'll go ahead and move the sixth grade and it will kind of transition and be this sort of year where we get them ready, ready for middle school. And um, I think that we've, it, it's continued to be a struggle for every, every school district, but um, for TUSD as well. It, it is difficult and we have to figure out a better solution and I know that you all are looking at what other school districts are doing across the country to see if they're doing anything different, any kind of innovative things, especially for this age group because there's so much pressure on them. And as a mom of a middle schooler, I can attest to things that my child, both children, never had a struggle with in elementary school. In that middle school environment, they started to have, they started to struggle. Um, Dr. Ravi. And then Ms. Luna Rose. Yeah, a comment and then um, some questions about the tier interventions. And so I, I wonder if the cohorts are the same. You know, after fifth grade, are we losing a lot of students in medical school? Are the, are the families that are less socioeconomically challenged leaving for other districts and the ones that are in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade in that middle school, are they, are they more socioeconomically challenged? Is that, is that really where we're looking at different cohorts? I'd love to dig deeper into this and really understand, you know, are, are, we, are we comparing apples and oranges or, or apples and apples in, in this data here? Uh, my question is about the tier um, interventions. You know, what qualifies students for tier two and tier three? Like, how are they chosen? How many students are receiving tier two and tier three interventions? Because we have tens of thousands of students that are not at proficient levels, and I, obviously we can't do tier two and tier three interventions for all, all the tens of thousands of students that are, aren't at level for, for reading and math, and so how do we select, and, you know, are we, and, and, and what, what can we really do in terms of those interventions to, to really move the needle for, for this majority of students that aren't at, at level for reading and math? Ms. Luna Rose. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have, did you want to respond? That was a question, yeah. <laughs> All right, as far as identifying our students that are in tier two, we have our MTSS system as I walk the board through. So typically it happens from the classroom teacher. So classroom teacher does the first instruction. When I was a classroom teacher, I would do my instruction and I would definitely identify those students that needed additional support and that becomes then the group that I do the intervention with. Similarly, that's what our teachers do. They identify those students with the common formative assessments during the day and they, they, because they know their students best. So that's how they identify the students in tier two interventions. First and foremost, the teacher. If those supports are not sufficient in the classroom, then that's when the MTSS team at the school site identifies those students that maybe they need a tier three, maybe they need additional support, maybe it's an after school program before the TLS targeted sessions. So typically that's how they're identified and we're happy to pull the data from our MTSS synergy if the board so chooses, so we can do that. Do we, do we have like a sense of how many students are receiving tier two or tier three? I would have to look at our synergy yeah, database, uh, Dr. Ravi. Dr. Trujillo and then Ms. Uh, Luna Rose. Yeah, and all of you visit schools, which is awesome. I, I do think that this is probably the most active governing board I've ever worked with that is out there visiting schools. Tier two interventions are actually done in front of you also. You can see it. Every time that you walk mm -hmm. in a classroom and you see a teacher in a small group, they're reteaching a key concept or skill in a more structured way and you might see the other kids either working with a TA, a parapro, or they may have assigned device work. Maybe they're doing a module in IXL. So sometimes you see those tier, those tier two interventions at the classroom level, they don't even really make it into MTSS. It's the tier threes that 
now you're talking extensive resources that probably that MTSS report would give us a true number, right? Mm -hmm. That we do more of our tier two stuff yeah. is sort of those everyday adjustments that uh, classrooms, I've been in some classrooms where the entire class is tier two, where I've actually seen the teacher say, stop, we're not gonna move forward, I've gotta reteach this in a different way and sort of extend the lesson out a little bit more. So I think our teachers have really developed strong skill sets at tier two interventions. Okay, Miss um, Luna Rose. Thank you. Um, as a mother of an eighth grader who started sixth grade and um, in, 20, in 2019 and just before her spring break, we go into COVID. So she's like that group. And I've seen some of her classmates just fall away. And I've talked to teachers, not just at her school, but other middle schools. Um, and traditionally, I know that middle school students that's kind of like the age where they start sort of dropping out and not coming to school. And so I'm wondering if there's a way that you can, uh, the administration can inform the board of like what, be, I know that, you know, we've got a lot of, you know, interventionalist programs, but where, where are these students going? If they're not staying here and not, you know, um, where are they going? Do they come back? And I think I'm, I'm kind of echoing Dr. Ravi's point and also you know looking into other districts what did what are they doing and how can we replicate that because I mean we've got great students and teachers and families in the district but what is the what is the the weak link there I think would be probably helpful to, to know um, and and I know this has been an ongoing problem and but I'm I, it's um, and my, you know, my daughter, you know, complains about IXL to me all the time, you know, <laughs> there's too much of it. Um, but I, I, I do think from what I can tell, I've sat down with her and gone through the program. I mean, I think it's a good program, um, but if we can somehow figure out through more of that data where, and where we're going, I think that would be helpful. It's a tool. And I think that um, that's, that's all we, it can be. It's a tool to help identify and help more targeted instruction. But um, this is just a cohort, right, that you're following that we're seeing. So this is not data of all of our, you know, third through eighth graders. This is just, just one, one school, school, one story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that, you know, we, um, in looking at giving, getting some additional information, how different is this story from the rest of our district and is, is it similar I think that that would be really telling too any additional questions Ms. Shaw and then Dr. Trujillo thank you uh, yeah you know uh, with this uh, presentation being about academic performance uh, progress like I really expected it to be more comprehensive to include high school levels to you know show like Dr. Ravi said um, you know how many students are in tier two how many are in tier three um, and also show um, this information aggregated by uh, race, ethnicity, and gender. And so it's, it's hard for us to get a comprehensive look at what's going on if we don't have all of the data, though I think, you know, we do have a lot of data that shows that there's a lot of students that need a lot of help. And so, uh, like Ms. Luna Rose said, I think we should look into what works in other districts, what works around the nation, and what things that we may have stopped uh, investing in in our own district that perhaps, you know, where those levels started to drop off dramatically, maybe it was when we uh, defunded our libraries. Um, you know, where, where did this begin and what, what did we, like, stop investing in at that time and what can we invest in now something tangible that they could hold in their hands that um, can boost these numbers. Any additional questions? I think Dr. Trujillo, we're just asking for more information. Dr. Trujillo, you had your hand up. Sure. Yeah, we, we, this is great because it gives us a gauge of when to come back. We, sometimes we over-prepare and right. the board doesn't like that level. <laughs> uh, so this time we got it very clear. Uh, I, I will also say that the state's A through F 
letter grade system, it's based off of growth. It defines student learning, largely the formula. Um, it gives the most amount of points to a school for growth. So you can have a school that has the predominant majority of its student body not reading at grade level, yet be a B school, because it took the predominant majority of its student body from minimally proficient on the assessment to partially proficient, and it took another portion from partially proficient to proficient. So you're moving across grade levels. And that's why we want to strike that balance, right? That balance of celebrating the learning going on, celebrating the growth, but also gently reminding our communities, our, our hardworking teachers and our staffs, that's awesome, C school, B school, but we still have a lot of students not reading at grade level, so we have to continuously improve. And so I, I don't want us to get totally wrapped up in letter grades, because I, I, I feel really, really good that based off of our internal benchmarks and what you saw this evening with the pre and post that we administered to the TUSD student body at large, largely for teacher evaluation purposes, um, we're expecting to see a lot of schools grow their kids. But we certainly don't want to create the impression that that's going to be good enough, right? So you, because you can have a C or a B school and still have a significant portion not reading at grade level. So we're going to continue to have to challenge our schools to continuously grow every year with their school improvement plans and processes. Yeah. Okay. Any additional questions, comments? Dr. Ravi. I think one, one final comment on this. I think, you know, in terms of how much data and how much information we have, you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussions over the, the short time we've been on the board, but this is, this is the most important, right? This is, this is the brass tacks, like our, mm -hmm. our students learning and growing. Um, and so I'd love to have this come back with more information and keep on having this conversation. You know, we, we have COVID readiness on our kind of standing agenda, but we don't have academic growth on our standing agenda and other things like, you know, but, but I think we need to start pivoting at some point uh, as a district, um, you know, to really addressing this really hardcore. Um, and it's probably not a very tactful way of saying this, you know, but to Ms. Luna's Rose's question, you know, what are other districts doing that we're not doing? They're, they're convincing the families of means to come to their districts and away from TUSD and you know with if, if those who can spend time with their kids after school and do the homework and 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 hone in on those skills at home which you know they're there they might be leaving the district and I don't know we have the this you know this the this, this same comparison uh, and that's not something we can we can do or have been doing effectively is keeping this the, the parents and the families here uh, in our district Okay, and I think Dr. Trujillo, uh, board members, if we want to send um, some requests for specific data sets to Dr. Trujillo, mm -hmm. so when we have this item come back, um, and you know we have that information. The other thing is that we also want to want these um, presentations, you know, a little more. <laughs> why am I the inseguido? Like. <laughs> Like, more often, yeah. <laughs> so you know, maybe once a month. Or... Well, this is this is what we yeah. need to be. I mean, this is right. what we need to be talking about. And and I tonight, I want to mark a hard pivot away from so much pandemic-dominated discussions. Uh, we need to at some point pivot mm -hmm. towards talking student achievement, talking socio-emotional learning, talking student support services, instructional expenditures needed at schools. I mean, these are the things that. You know, and, and even though it was a tough di discussion, we're talking capital. That goes hand in hand with what we're supposed to be talking about here. So we would uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to come back with any additional requests, spend a lot more time digging in to the state of student growth and student achievement in our district. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So thank you. next, thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. Um, Next is 10.2 TUSD transportation study. Dr. Trujillo. Yes, President Grijalva, members of the governing board. So we wanted to take uh, some time uh, this evening to sort of give what I'll call the post-mortem <laughs> on the transportation survey, uh, which resulted in, as, I, as I've announced, uh, an overwhelming uh, rejection of, of uh, school start times and end times. But just to give an overview before we get into this presentation, which will basically give you the results now that we've got the full survey in. 
And then we're gonna talk about next steps. Obviously our community spoke overwhelmingly that they were not in favor of uh, changing bell schedules for start times or end times. And when I say community, that's our staff and our parents uniformly saying the same message. But what brought this on was when we were looking at opportunities to uh, reimagine transportation with a larger ridership. We have an increasing demand of students that want the service, but then we also have a shrinking workforce, right? Because of the labor shortage, it's a struggle to get the bus drivers. So the essential questions emerged, how can we meet the needs of a larger portion of our population that's growing every year that wants transportation services, but be able to do it with a smaller workforce and to do it through the neighborhood routes that our families have always enjoyed and come to expect from TUSD. Stops closest to their homes. Well, the way that, only way that that was going to be feasible was to create three shifts of transportation services to students. How is that different? TUSD's always operated off of two shifts. Two blocks of time each day where we deploy our drivers for arrivals and departures to and from home to school we would have had to fit in a third shift of deploying our drivers. And that, of course, necessitated potential changes to bell schedules at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, which led to our survey, which Leslie's gonna walk us through now that I've kind of given that context. And then we're gonna talk about next steps in our attempts to uh, meet the needs of our community. Ms. Lenhart. Great, thank you. Good evening, Governing Board again. Um, so as Dr. Trujillo suggested, we're gonna walk through just the details of where we landed on each of the survey questions. Um, so you just have context around um, how people responded. Jean, next slide. So we, um, in this uh, what presentation, you'll see that I've combined, um, and you'll see both parent and employee um, responses together. Um, and they both responded in all cases very similarly. Um, we did the survey, let it uh, play out for two weeks. It ended on March 7th. We had over 11,000 responses, of which um, almost a little over seven, almost 7,900 were from parents and 3,400 were from staff. Next slide. So we'll walk through each of the scenarios um, and then we can look at what the responses were. So we had four scenarios. The first one was having our elementary school's bell, st uh, bell schedule start at 7.30 and end at 1.40. High schools followed at 8.20 and ending at 3.20. And K-8 and middle schools starting at 9.10 and ending at 4.10. In both cases, parents and employees, um, in general, we received 65% or almost 66% of our family, of our staff, uh, did not think this would be a good option for the bell schedules for their schools. Uh, next slide. So in scenario two, it was very similar, but we just changed the time by 10 minutes because there was a question if that 10 minutes might help people get to and from, um, get people to and from their students to school, but still be able to make it to work and give them just a little extra time at home. So elementary schools started at 740, high schools at 830, and K-8s and middle schools starting at 920. Again, overwhelmingly, we had 65% um, of parents and almost 70% of employees felt that this would not be a good option for them. The third scenario, um, excuse me, is elementary schools starting at 7.30, but this, in this case we switched K-8s and middle schools to be our second tier starting at 8.20, and high schools starting at 9.10. Um, and in this case, um, parents responded that 67% felt this would not work for them, and 63% of staff felt this would not work for them. And then our last scenario, um, again, similar to the third one, but just starting 10 minutes later, was elementary starting at 7.40, K-8s and middle schools starting at 8.30, and high schools starting at 9.20. And this was the most acceptable one at 59% of our um, parents and employees uh, saying this would not work for them. Next slide. So um, as you can see from this slide, we had um, a 
group across the board from all our areas, from all levels of schools, um, for both parents and from staff members that responded to the survey so it wasn't swayed by any one group. And next slide, I think that was it. Any specific questions on this? Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Ms. Samora to provide the follow-up on updates. Okay. Good evening, President Grijalva and um, members of the board. So for the next steps for transportation, we will be doing and, um, a review of our current hubs. Um, we will review and examine them um, to make sure that that is what's needed for the community and evaluate their safety as we move over for our next school year. Uh, we are doing all the efforts that we can as far as recruiting so that we put as many routes as we can uh, for the following school year. In regards to our recruitment efforts, we are doing, um, we created a web page. Uh, if you go to TUSD1.org slash bus drivers, that gives information for anyone that might be interested in becoming a driver. Um, I would like to remind our employees um, that there's a $250 stipend if they refer to us, someone that might be interested in being a driver. And we went ahead and created some referral cards to make it easier uh, for someone to refer to someone to be a driver. So I wanted to share just a couple of things. Um, I, I think when we're looking for bus drivers, um, it, it's very hard. Um, thank you for putting that up there. Um, you have community members that might be interested and then you have the fear of being behind a big um, yellow bus. But from my experience in working in transportation and from all the drivers that I talk to on a daily basis, it is a job that is extremely gratifying. You become part of a community and you become part of that growth of that student as they transition from school year to school year. And some of the stories that I hear from our drivers from stories of them working with our exceptional education students and working from weeks on end for that one child to finally say hi to them, or from the story of the student that needed assistance, the family didn't realize that um, a McKinney Vento student that, you know, we have uh, the clothing bank and, and other op uh, um, options out there where we can help. So there is like so much, so many stories, so many positive feedback that I get from drivers and we might have somebody out there in the community that it's not sure if this is a job for them. Being a driver is not for everyone. But we wanted to create a page where they can go and look at all the information. We are doing recruiting events on a weekly basis. So they can come and join us on one of our recruiting events where we'll provide more information and they get to talk to drivers and actually hear from them. But for some of our drivers, um, they'll come back and, and they wish they would have um, started with us a lot sooner. Um, they might have worked at a grocery store, um, maybe a parent that stayed at home that, you know, once they realize how gratifying it is, that they would have wished they would have joined sooner. So um, with that said, um, if you guys have any questions for me. Any questions on this specific issue? Okay. Oh, Dr. Trujillo. I will say we are going to be doing a comprehensive evaluation of hub location. Uh, we have heard this community loud and clear that um, there are challenges with, with some of the hubs where they're located. You know, we've heard from some of our parents that say, hey, Trujillo, listen, I mean, I'm driving two miles past my neighborhood school to a hub that's four miles away only for the bus to turn back around and drive two miles back to the school that I passed. So you know what? I'm just going to drive my kid to school. So we're going to fix that. Like that, there's going to be a, a comprehensive overview. Um, we're going to look at hub location, we're going to make sure that they are practical, that they make sense for parents. And then our new school safety director, Mr. Hallams, and his team, they're going to be assessing each hub stop for safety. That's another thing that we've heard from our community. Uh, concerns about proximity to major intersections, um, dangerous areas of town. So we want to also make sure that the hubs that, we're, that we are selecting are safe and that they're accessible. And then also a bright spot is that we're going to have some opportunities to put some routes back through two avenues. Number one, through hiring, whoever we bring in and we see that our recruitment efforts are in full swing. But in any given year, um, the average for TUSD ridership, it's about 75 or 80%. We always build our routes 
assuming that 100% of the eligible student body are gonna take the routes. So we're gonna be quicker this year in identifying who's opting out of the transportation. So every time that we have students and families that are eligible for transportation services that opt out for whatever reason, they find their own ride to school, that frees up drivers and that could put routes back into neighborhoods. So we're gonna be working hard to find that information out sooner rather than later. Thank you. I do think that um, my daughter utilized the bus for a bit and one of the concerns that I've heard from parents is I would, I would opt to take my child to school directly but one of the issues is supervision. And so if I have to be to work by eight o'clock and the soonest that my child could go on campus is 8.15. That doesn't really help me. And so they might be utilizing transportation in order to ensure their child gets safely to school and they can get safely to work. So one of the things that was brought up when you were talking about this survey is before and after school kind of coverage and options that are low to no cost for families. Are we still exploring that, Dr. Trujillo? Yes, um, childcare is in the works. So right now, um, our director for early childhood slash community schools, Reem Kivit, she is aggressively pushing KidCo for an aggressive expansion into mm -hmm. TUSD. Uh, so she's in talk, she's leading that effort for us. We're gonna get her in uh, probably in, in uh, one of our meetings in April. Our HR department is also working with Mrs. Kivit to rewrite the job description for those staff members that supervise kids. Uh, inside of our before and after school program so that they're full time. You're gonna see um, in our upcoming budget discussions, we're gonna be recommending that the board set aside a budgetary allocation to just start funding before and after school, school care and making it more widely available. Um, so making those positions full time and benefits eligible, I think is gonna take care of a lot of the challenges that we're seeing with applicant shortages Expanding KidCo is gonna be crucial for us to be able to bring them into more of our schools. And then we also know that we're not gonna be able to hire, even if we redo the job description and it becomes full time, we're also very realistic. We're probably not gonna be able to fill all those positions. So we're probably gonna to have to look at another budgetary allocation to make monies available to schools so that they can pay existing staff members added duty to get into the campus early, stay later, and provide those before and after school care. So it's gonna be a three-pronged approach that we're working on because we understand now that maybe 10 or 15 years ago, the viewpoint may have been, you know, you're on your own for childcare. We're responsible for school. Landscape's totally changed. Um, childcare has become a real barrier for families. It's become a real obstacle to access an opportunity to kids and we need to own it and it shouldn't any longer be something that somebody has to pay for in order to get access to school or to allow their kids to come into school. So we're gonna be doing a um, public presentation a little bit later in April as these pieces start to come together and certainly they're gonna have budgetary impact. So they're gonna show up uh, in our budget discussions that will be happening soon. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this item? So thank you so much. Thank you. So Dr. Trujillo, we had two items that we uh, didn't get to address in executive session. Do we still need to, to address those this evening? Yes, um, I would recommend that we do go into executive session. Those are two crucial items. But, but before we do, I just wanna take a moment and uh, number one, I wanna apologize to the governing board. My job as the leader of our team is to make sure that all of our team members are in a position to be successful. I have every opportunity to review presentations, slides, uh, information and my making assumptions that encumbrances were reflected in our capital numbers wasn't accurate and it didn't set our team member up for success. Now, I'm happy that the governing board did approve a piece of our package here this evening. I'm also happy that we had a very thorough discussion about what our capacity is and what the capital needs are in this district. I think that's very, very important. But at the end of the day, it is my job to make sure that information that is in front of this board uh, is as clean and as accurate and as on point as possible. That didn't happen tonight. Take responsibility for that. And we will be back again. This is a learning moment for us. And we'll be back again uh, to talk more capital in the near future. So thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. And I will say, um, specifically, our finance reports have been really thorough and very detailed, and um, I have appreciated that. And I think that um, in looking at the finance information that was presented, I don't know um, who was the last person to sort of, you know, kind of toy with it, but I don't think that that is reflective at all of the quality of work that Ms. Weatherless and the finance team has brought to the board. And so um, I would hope that in the future, if we have concerns about things, that we direct it to our only employee, which is Dr. Trujillo. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and um, recess the or end our our public meeting and we're going to go into executive session and we'll be and we we'll, we will um recess our meeting and end our meeting adjourn our meeting from executive session okay but, oh we had one other item i apologize the future meeting dates and agenda items i think we gave you a couple <laughs> during the meeting <laughs> dr Trujillo. Yeah, i have got, to say we got a few yeah yeah okay we'll be back all right. Well, thank you again for your um, for those of you that are still joining us, and um, we're going to go ahead and adjourn our public meeting. Thank you.